All right, and this is a virtual meeting using the Zoom platform. Members of the public can view this meeting live on Channel 8 or the city's website. Live Spanish translation services are being provided for tonight's council meeting by telephone. Please dial 720-386-9023 and use code 104091-STAR. Si necesita traducción o interpretación para esta junta, puede marcar 720-29023 usando el código 104091-ESTRELLA. Thank you, Councilmember Guardiola. Uh, if you're a council member, please be sure to have your video camera on and be mindful that we are streaming this meeting on Channel 8 and on our city's website. Chat function is disabled to ensure that the public can see all portions of the meeting. City clerk is the host of the meeting and I and our IT staff will be the co-host. Council members and panelists will be able to unmute themselves when recognized. Please mute yourself when you have finished speaking and remember to lower your virtual hand to prevent disruption. When called steady session to order, we have two presentations this evening. The first is a road impact and the second is the 2021 snow and ice control plan update. Would like to invite Brent Soderland, city engineer, to make the presentation on the road impact fee update. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Dylan, can you move? Uh, oh, Jennifer Carpenter is here. Okay. So can uh, all the council members see my screen? We can, yes, Brent. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of City Council. Tonight, I will be presenting uh, an update on our road impact fees, uh, mainly focusing on funding requirements and versus our current fees. Uh, tonight, helping me with the presentation is Jennifer Carpenter with uh, Michael Baker. Um, Jennifer's firm is the one that helped us um, to put together our um, road impact fee update. So as an overview, I'll be covering the, the purpose and need, um, the study area, the application of the fee, um, our future roadway network, um, analysis of the fee. Um, comparisons would be existing fee versus um, the build out um, fee. Um, I'll cover some example um, calculations of the road impact fee, um, comparison to other Colorado cities, and then our next steps. So the purpose and need, the city is developing rapidly and our road impact fees have not been updated since the year 2000. Um, the original ordinance recommended that we update the fee every three years. Um, the road impact fee is based upon older and now outdated construction costs and old uh, chip trip generation numbers. So since 2000, um, CDOT's construction index has basically increased uh, three and a half percent per year. And so since 2000, that's a generally an increase of about 208% of construction costs. So the city needs to update our road impact fee to help fund um, expansion of our future arterial roadways. So what we have here is um, the impact fee study area. And so basically it's broken down into three areas. Um, the first area is basically everything west of Highway 2, that's zone one. Uh, zone two is basically between Highway 2 and Piccadilly. And then zone three is between Piccadilly and Watkins Road, which is basically our future growth area north of DIA. Um, the original ordinance was set up so that fees collected within each zone could only be spent within that zone. So the application of the road impact fee, it only applies to our arterial roads and it only applies to projects that add capacity. So for example, um, 104th Avenue between say Highway 2 and Tower is currently a full four lane road. Um, this would only be to add the extra two lanes to make it a six lane road. And so that would include, you know, expansion of bridges and culverts that result as a result of the road widening. Um, the road impact fee can be credited back to developers that build arterial road improvements. So here's our, our future roadway network. Um, 
you can see that our principal arterials, basically our six lane roads, um, that would be 104th Avenue, uh, Tower, High, High Plains Parkway, Highway 2 and 120th Avenue. Our minor arterial roadways is our four lane roads. Um, that's basically 88th, 96th, um, and then several roads east of E470. And then our multimodal arterials are basically our two lane arterial roadways. Um, that's like Brighton Road, 112th Avenue, and Peoria and Potomac Street. So also analysis of the road impact fee. So we anticipate residential build out by 2055. So the cost to build all these arterial roadways is right around 634 million. And those are based on um, 2021 costs. Um, we have not accounted for an escalator in these um, calculations. And so we need, this includes road widening needed to accommodate future development. So the current road impact fee balance is roughly 3 million. So we have a shortfall of roughly $630 million. So this slide shows um, our current fees versus, versus what we need for build out. And as you can see, if we look, it doesn't matter which fee we look at, um, they're all increasing pretty substantially. And so here's some example calculations. Um, so for a single family dwelling, um, you can see that our current fee is 1,181 and our proposed fee is basically $4,800. So that's basically an increase, it's a four time um, increase of the fee. And then the, our next example is a shopping center. That fee basically increases by about three times. And then the last fee is basically we're a fast food restaurant and that fee increases by eight times. I guess the one thing I wanna note is the way that the fee is um, generated, it, it's dependent on the number of trips that a site generates. So for example, obviously a single family house doesn't generate as many trips as a fast food restaurant. So that kind of, um, I guess that shows the big disparity between like a commercial development and a single family development. So this slide just shows um, some current road impact fee comparisons to some surrounding cities. Uh, so the city of Aurora for a single family, their fee is basically 5,400. Uh, the city of Brighton has a relatively low fee for a single family house at about 1,700. Uh, Fort Collins is right around 3,000 for a single family. And the city of Greeley is roughly 4,700. So our current fee, is $1,181 for a single family home. And the, our proposed build out fee was roughly $4,800. So our next steps. Um, so before we brought any recommendations back to city council, we wanted to consider um, some of these questions. Um, for example, the way the current fee is calculated, it's basically an average of the entire northern range and what it costs to build out the, our, those arterials. And so then we asked ourselves, so what is the fi financial build out requirements for each zone? And I did make some rough calculations for what each zone requirement is. So zone one, basically west of Highway 2, is a, it has about $77 million of improvements needed. Uh, zone two, which was Highway 2, to Piccadilly is basically, basically 348 million. And then zone three, our area north of DIA is 209 million. So based on those numbers, um, we asked ourselves the question, should we reconsider or should we consider redrawing the road impact these zone areas? And then our other question is, what is the funding interaction between the GIDs and the road impact fee zones? And then the, our last question was, should the new impact fees be deferred or phased in? And so that's the, the end of my presentation. So if, um, if you have any questions, uh, Jennifer and I would be happy to take those questions. Councilmember Noble. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Sonderlin. It's really uh, important for us to be taking a look at this, especially since we have been under. So this will be great. I'm a little confused um, about the impact fees when uh, we're looking at uh, Initiative 6A and 6B right now that covers infrastructure. Are these based on the infrastructure costs within the initiative 6A and 6B? So this update does not include um, the infrastructure costs for the, the GID that's going out to the voters. So this is basically just um, infrastructure needed in the Northern range. And um, I guess that's one of the reasons we wanted to come back is we wanna consider um, the effect of, of, I guess that vote for those improvements within the GID. Yeah, I think that would be an important step first to see the results of that before we make these decisions. And um, in light of the pandemic and the way that people operate now and um, the revisions that um, companies are making in, in the term, in the way that they operate, you know, our, my bank, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, does all of its deposits uh, by a cell phone now. You can just take a picture of your check and do it by cell phone. So you don't have to drive up to the kiosk. Um, you know, King Supers is that kind of uh, market has tons of vehicle traffic compared to any of the restaurants in Commerce City right now. I'm not sure that the numbers are skewing to the way that um, commercial development is playing out. And also, I didn't see warehouses on that list. And, uh, you know, we were at a, a giant, giant warehouse today with lots of uh, trucks outside. And I'm sure that uh, warehouses in those trucks uh, are impactful as well. And I, I do have a figure for that. Yeah, so there is... Um... The impact fee did go up for warehouses as well. It was just not an example that I stuck on the, the presentation, but I can I can certainly find that information. I'm sure it's it's increased, you know, quite a bit. I was gonna ask, is Jennifer still on the presentation? It looks like she's gone. Yes, right. No, she's here. Oh, there you I'm go. I'm here. <laughs> so Jennifer, do you happen to have that information on the warehouses? Um, I don't I do have um the report in front of me, I would say that for any land uses that exist, we um, can calculate that fee, even if it's not included in the report that was provided to you. Um, I am looking at it right now, and I don't see, I see business park as an option. Um, I think I that's pretty, see, that's, that one's have, pretty critical. We have general light industrial and industrial park as well. Um, okay, then is this for only new development or for existing development? So I, I believe this fee is only for new developments. We were, we were trying to research the old ordinance to see if there was any language about redevelopments and we didn't find anything, but of course the ordinance is, is relatively old. Okay, so we, oh, sorry. I was just gonna okay. say, so we have, um, Fast food restaurants at 40,000 build out fee and sit down restaurants at $27,000 and banks at $32,000. And those just seem uh, particularly high. This is not to say that I don't think we need road impact fee, just sort of another look at the way the world is unfolding now, especially the impacts of this uh, kind of traffic on Commerce City. And certainly people are very focused on the fact that we have a lot of trucks. Um, I'd be happy to respond to that. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, Council Member Noble, I just wanna point out in the examples in the PowerPoint that Brent showed you, um, it is a little deceiving when you look at the fee itself, but when you then consider the typical size of a, say a fast food restaurant or a grocery store, um, and you apply that fee, that's how you get, for example, a typical shopping center or, or grocery stores, maybe 50,000 square feet. And so with their fee being 10,000 roughly per thousand square feet, 
their total build out cost is about 522,000. A fast food restaurant is typically only about 3,000 square feet. Um, so that's their fee, even though it's 40,000, when you calculate it out based on a typical size of a fast food restaurant, it ends up being about 120,000. So the fees can be a little bit deceiving. Um, and I just, I wanted to point that out as um, something that is important. Um, and with regard to your comments earlier about how COVID has changed things, um, the standard by which we calculate trips that are generated by different uses is the ITE trip generation manual. Um, and they are constantly updating that. They just came out with the 11th edition, um, which was not used for this study because it literally just came out a week or two ago. <laughs> and we had already okay. completed the study by then. Um, but yes, things are constantly changing and the um, standards by which we calculate those numbers are always also being updated regularly. And thank you, Jennifer, for so um, uh, diplomatically correcting me. Um, I can be very dense sometimes. So now I understand that this it's is on a per thousand square foot basis. So that does, that does tend to help a bit. Thank you sure. so much. No problem. Councilmember Madera. Yeah, Councilmember Noble uh, asked the question that I had was, you know, about fees for different types of uses, because obviously we have a lot of logistics companies and um, the wear and tear that they provide the, the roads is a lot more than, uh, you know, having a fast food restaurant with, you know, light vehicles. So I'm glad to see that that's something that we, we're taking into consideration. Um, I had another question about for these fees for the commercial, these are the fees that we're currently waiving, right? No, I, I don't believe that we can actually waive road impact fees. It's basically um, our building fees and that, that kind of fees that we're waiving. Um, the, I believe they still have to pay the road impact fees. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Thanks, Member Hurst. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I just wanted to continue to expand on uh, Councilwoman Noble's question of who this impacts. You know, we hear that there's 180 land use cases. Um, so does it, if we were to approve, is this going to roll out immediately? Are we going to do a step stepping program? Um, and then from there, um, I, I'm in support of this. I, I I mean, we're way off. Um, I 100% support this um, with the assessment you guys did. I just want to make sure that we have the appropriate communication plan um, of how we don't make this a negative spin for us. We're just, you know, equalizing ourselves to the region uh, based off the needs of growth and um, ensuring that we have that right, right messaging to support this move. Because uh, when businesses move here, they want to have a quality infrastructure as well. That's part of the reason you would select our, our city. And so we're going to have to continue to maintain that and the costs are going up. Nobody's, nobody's worried or nobody's um, blind to that. So I think this is all great. I just want to make sure, you know, as this moves forward, that we're communicating these steps appropriately um, as part of our, our business um, communication plan, as we're uh, trying to recruit new business to come in. The other piece that I have, is I think uh, we should consider redevelopment uh, impact fees as long as it's been 10 years or more. Um, so, you know, if somebody builds a, a building with a one intention, the market changes, they're forced to, to, to make a, um, some redevelopment construction changes because, you know, that's just what happens sometimes in business. But that's only three years later, you know, unless the numbers are significantly changes, maybe we don't, we don't, force a redevelopment fee. But if it's 10 years and it's a different use of business or, or the significant increase in uh, trip generation, we should consider um, the impacts that that's gonna create because that system was not built with those intentions. And as those intentions or as that system changes, our intentions have to be um, met and to uphold the performance and quality that we all expect. And so um, I'd support that too. I think this is, this is a good fundamental um, understanding of how we're going to have to uh, manage our assets moving forward. Brent, could I respond to that? Sure, go ahead, Jennifer. 
Um, Council Member Hurst, uh, just want to let you know that in some other municipalities, um, the way they handle redevelopment is to look at what is the existing use, what is the future use, and what is the difference in trips that are being generated to then come up with a fee. And in the at the end of the impact fee um, update, we have a table that tells you exactly how you can calculate that fee. So um, you could have these redevelopment properties do a study to kind of figure out what those new trips would be. Um, something else to consider that I've seen done in the past as well is any use that has been vacant for three years or more is considered, you know, ground zero and, you know, anything new would um, be, be the, the impact fee would based on, be based on the new development, not including anything that was there before. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, we're always looking to um, continue to promote, uh, you know, efficiency and sustainability. I, I think, you know, if we do consider some type of redevelopment, um, you know, one of the, I think, I think we almost disincentivize redevelopment at times. And so I'm not trying advocating for that, but I, you know, if we're going to go that route, I also think if you find a business that um, even if it's the same business, but you can do it more efficiently and reduce trips um, by whatever means, I think we should look at um, a tax incentive for that, you know, and so if you have um, all of a sudden you are going to reduce the amount of trucks that come into your operation because you're going to move stuff on uh, on the train. Okay, let's incentivize that right uh, and I'm the truck guy you guys know that but I still think efficiency is what we should be incentivizing. Um, and I think that is also part of the asset management plan moving forward is let's not incentivize more and more trips let's incentivize more efficiency. Councilmember Allen Thomas. Thank you, Mayor. I was just curious, do you guys know um, how much money overall has the city been missing out on um, to date from not having an update on the road impact fees over the last five years? Yeah, I guess I don't know how, we've, how much we've missed out in the last five years. Um, I mean, obviously it's a significant amount. Um, well, what year's amount do you have then? Do you have the last? Well, I mean, so we know that we've only got $300 million, or sorry, excuse me. We, only, we know that we only have $3 million in the road impact fee now, and that we have a $634 million need. So, I mean, it's a huge number. It's probably hundreds of millions of dollars, I would say, that we're missing out on. Oh, okay. Thanks. And I was just curious, do you guys have a map that shows the south end of the city? I, I, in the presentation, I just saw the north, but do you have anything showing the south? That, that is, that's a good question, Council Member Alan Thomas. Um, the original impact fee was just set up for growth within the northern range. There is not a road impact fee for um, the historic part of the city. So that may be something else that we need to consider as you know, parts of the core city are also redeveloping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I would, you know, I was concerned that wasn't addressed. So I would like the city eventually to have more information for the mayor and council on the south area as well. Thank you. Council Member Hurst. Ah, I failed to lower my hand, apologize. Any other comments or questions regarding this presentation? Seeing none, my only question, what is our course moving forward? I know Councilman Rao, uh, Noble mentioned waiting to see the success of 6A and 6B. When are we looking at actually implementing change on this in this coming before council for a vote? Yeah, so I would like to bring back um, both the drainage impact fee and the road impact fee with recommendations to council at a study session, hopefully in November. And then as a result of that study session, I would hope to try to move forward with some type of ordinance um, at the beginning of, of the year in January. Okay, thank you very much. Look forward to seeing that soon. Next up, we will move on to the 2021 snow and ice control plan. I would like to invite Willis Waterhouse 
streets maintenance supervisor to give us the presentation. And Kirk Dominic. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, can you hear me fine? Okay, good deal. Dylan, will you be running the slideshow or do you want me to present? Yes, sir. Just let me know whenever you're ready to move to the next slide. Okay, thank you, sir. I'm currently seeing your desktop there, Dylan. Hmm, give me just one second. Okay. How about now? There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Willie. Okay. Um, as the mayor said, we were here to talk about the uh, snow and ice control plan updates for 2021-2022 season. Uh, on your screen, you have the overview of what we'll talk about tonight. So we're going to cover uh, the snow and ice control program goals, the priority streets and snow storm classifications, performance goals, team resources available to us, uh, staff training that we conduct, the communications plans that we have in place, uh, citizens' responsibilities, uh, an update on road closures, and um, the emergency snow plan, which uh, Kirk Dominic will uh, take over that portion of the presentation. Go ahead and move to the next slide, please, Dylan. So the program goals, goals for the snow and ice control program are to provide a fiscally responsible service during snow and ice control events that support the safety and mobility of the city's transportation system by removing or displacing snow and ice from all designated priority streets, parking areas, trails, and city-maintained sidewalks as safely as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a overview of the street classifications for our priority levels. Uh, we have five, four priorities. Uh, number one is major arterials that connect all of the areas of the city and as well as uh, get access to hospitals, fire and police stations, and other emergency units. Priority twos are all the remaining arterials in the city and uh, selected collectors completing the network providing school access. Priority three is all the remaining collectors, bus routes, and uh, hilly or problem areas that we're aware of. And priority four is the low uh, volume residential streets, and these are only plowed uh, as necessary when snow is blocking uh, traffic movement. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview of our uh, overall road classification map. As you'll see, priority ones are designated in red and they provide that overall grid that we spoke about. Uh, priority twos are um, allowing us access into neighborhoods, getting us through and completing those networks to major portions of the city. Uh, priority threes are in yellow and um, not listed uh, on this view, but if you had a uh, larger map, you could see uh, all of the priority fours uh, that would be listed out in gray area on there. Um, we also have color coded for uh, other surrounding agencies uh, to help identify who's responsible for other areas that come in and through around the skirts of the city, or skirt, outskirts of the city. Um, next slide, please. Overview of the storm classifications. We have three main classifications for uh, regular storms. Uh, a class one storm would be a storm that's pr predicted to be less than 12 hours in length or drop four or less inches of snow. A class two priority would be greater than 12 hours or four to eight inches of snow. And a class three storm would be uh, a storm that was predicted for 24 or more hours and to drop eight inches or more of snow. Next slide, please. So priorities and our performance goals for these classes of storms and a class one, again, the uh, lower level of storms, we're gonna clear all snow from all travel lanes of all priority ones and two streets, and then provide at least one passable travel lane to priority three streets. During a class two storm, uh, during the event, we would clear all st snow from travel lanes on priority ones and twos. And then during cleanup operations or when sufficient uh, time allowed, uh, we would do priority ones and twos cleanup and clear all snow from travel lanes of, of priority three streets. And during a three storm, during the event, we would provide at least one passable travel lane to priority one streets. And after the time or after the storm or when sufficient clearing allowed uh, of priority ones would allow us to get to uh, priority level twos, we would clear all of those. And then again, as we were allowed to get down to priority threes, we would move into our priority three classifications. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is uh, our team resources and what we have available to us. Uh, I do apologize. I have a uh, minor error here to uh, address on. So on the streets, we have actually, we're going to keep 15 tandem trucks uh, this year. So we this year we will have 15 tandem trucks uh, available. Uh, four one-ton trucks with plows and sanders, one loader, one backhoe, uh, one motor grader. And we are currently uh, working on getting a short-term rental of a loader uh, to have increased capacity out on roadways for major storm events. Uh, we have 19 full-time staff members, which includes two maintenance supervisors in the streets division. The parks division has access to seven one-ton trucks with plows and sanders, four additional one-ton trucks with just plows only, four small pickup trucks like a Colorado or a Ranger uh, with a plow, uh, seven small units that we have that are mowers that convert over to plow and cabs for snow removal, one skister, one tractor, and we have 13 full-time park staff members, which includes the two maintenance supervisors. And this year we will be keeping uh, up to 10 parks variable hour staff members through the winter months to assist with snow operations and, and winter operations overall. Those folks do not have CDL, so they're not rolled into the overall program for driving tandems, but the uh, full-time staff of parks are rolled into the overall uh, street control plan for out on the, out on the roadways in the tandem dump truck. Next slide, please. Uh, again, we're going to keep 14, uh, tan 15 tandem uh, trucks this year with the addition of uh, four new units that were requested in 2021, two of which are uh, ready to be deployed to us within the next week or so. And we should have the other two remaining units uh, within the next month uh, was the update from fleet. And uh, that will actually uh, bring us to uh, 10 units that are uh, we have 10 units currently right now that are 2016 or newer. That'll bring us to 14 units total that are 2016 or newer. That was uh, one more error on that slide. I apologize. Uh, next slide, please. So overview of the staff training that we do annually uh, within the Parks and Streets Division. Again, it's a joint resource that the Parks Division full-time staff members help out with the plowing needs on the streets as needed. Um, so we have Tandem axle plow truck operation and plow sanding uh, techniques that we train on, one ton truck operations uh, and their techniques inside of parking lots and on roadways as well. Small equipment plowing techniques, the overall uh, training on the over eight districts that we have throughout the city. Um, buildings, grounds, park site specific training, where to stack snow and uh, emergency exits, all that kind of stuff around the buildings. Truck and equipment, preventative maintenance, upkeep and calibrations, and assorted other trainings such as slip, trip, and fall, shovel and back safety, and winter preparedness. Next slide, please. Um, the communications division put, pumps out uh, information to the to the community through the Snow Trooper uh, application, which is available on the city's website at the link provided there. Uh, quick note: there is we are currently working with the IT department, and the IT department is providing an overhaul to the Snow Trooper application, uh, taking that information uh, and actually moving the application completely in-house. Uh, that's going to provide us with additional resources to uh, provide future overlays uh, and capture all of our information that we're currently uh, displaying and getting from trucks and, and have that as reportable uh, information inside of our GIS system. So it should greatly increase our ability to run reports and kind of and analyze our um, operation. As well with that, we're adding additional sensors and uh, additional capabilities uh, over the next uh, year or two uh, that will be coming online into that system to greatly increase our ability to monitor, track, and plan our resources uh, throughout the storm events. So next slide, please. Uh, internal communications that we have set up and programmed through the communications division, they will provide news and views, employee newsletter articles. They'll provide information for weather information, hotline reminders prior to storms and prior to the beginning of the season, uh, winter weather tips. They'll provide intranet news posts for uh, employees of the city, and they update the internal information hotline with the number provided there to inf inform everybody of facility closures, delay starts, or other uh, issues that need to be uh, relayed out for weather-related activities. Next slide. Uh, similar to the internal communications, we have uh, the same thing set up for external communications, communicating to the citizens. Uh, so overall, they will provide connected, uh, city connected newsletter articles um, that would talk about various things, mainly Snow Trooper and online mapping, and uh, provide social media posts, 
uh, for through Nextdoor, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, website news flash alerts are possible, and they update the external emergency weather hotline that would provide information on facility closures. Again, community relations runs uh, this whole process as well in conjunction with us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, citizens do share some responsibility in cleanup efforts, obviously, throughout the snowstorms uh, in the city. So uh, in, in the city code of ordinances, section 6, uh, 2013, talks about sidewalks and rights of way. Um, so citizens are responsible for removing snow and ice from sidewalks within 24 hours of the last accumulation on their sidewalks. Uh, they're not allowed to dump or deposit snow off of their private property onto public property or a neighbor's property. And they cannot dump or deposit snow against fire hydrants or traffic control devices. Next slide, please. For 2021, this season, uh, before the end of the year, we anticipate having installation of new road closure barricades. If you will recall, uh, 96th Avenue has a problem area between uh, Highway 2 and Chambers that blows closed frequently. Uh, the hill there also has folks lose traction uh, as they're coming up that slope and uh, stalls out vehicles. So um, last year during the blizzard, we had uh, problems keeping that section closed without having folks drive around the barricades that were up. Uh, so we have identified funding sources and we are um, in the process of doing installation of barricades there that would close those down, similar to what you see on uh, the major highways that CDOT has uh, closing the highway off. And again, in 2020, we purchased 30 additional, or the total of 30 type three barricades. Uh, those are still in stock and uh, ready for rapid deployment on roadsides as needed. And we have a trailer ready for rapid deployment uh, as necessary if something happens in the middle of the storm necessitating a closure or, or road, um, road blockage for accidents and whatnot. Um, next slide, please. So with that, uh, I'll let Kirk talk about our severe weather plans. All right, thank you, Willis. Uh, welcome, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Dylan, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, a lot of people realize that the plan is in the past has been known as the emergency snow plan, but the official title about uh, two years ago is the Severe Winter Weather and Extreme Cold Operation Plan Annex uh, to the EOS, to the uh, EOP. Um, and then uh, we update this plan uh, in September, October, based on uh, lessons learned from previous storms. Um, and then main, the main stakeholders that are involved in the update are, is myself, uh, Willis, and then uh, um, police department. And then I get solicited, uh, solicited feedback from other city departments that were involved in any operations from the year prior. Next slide, please. And the purpose of, the, uh, of this annex is to bring all available city resources to bear during a severe winter storm, um, extreme cold weather event, in order to uh, maintain public safety access to every citizen in our city. An example of that would be what we had uh, last March um, in where we received 27 inches of snow in about 12 hours. So it's uh, outside the normal uh, snow removal plan. When activated, this plan will supersede the snow and ice control response plan, uh, which is used for uh, normal snow events, which we'll just discuss. Next slide, please. Uh, the authority to activate this plan would be the city manager, his designee, or uh, chief of police, or uh, uh, his or her designee. So um, next slide, please. Then implementation circumstances that we use, uh, severe winter, the annex will be for uh, severe winter weather, extreme cold events, and I, I'll give some further definitions on that, uh, that produce life-threatening and hazardous driving conditions. Um, for an example, in the insurance of a uh, winter weather warning for heavy snow by the National Weather Service, and their definition is six inches of snow in 12 hours or eight inches of snow in, or more in 24 hours, or the insurance of a blizzard uh, warning uh, again, a definition of blizzard is 35 mile an hour or higher winds, the same winds falling or blowing snow, reducing visibility to a quarter mile or less for a minimum of three hours. And if you guys remember the storm back in uh, last March, that that's uh, we had both the blizzard and both we had the heavy uh, snowfall. So that would be a good, that was a great example of why we implement this plan. Um, next slide, please. 
uh, more circumstances is a wind chill warning, uh, which means minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit or colder with the same winds of at least uh, 10 miles an hour or a large area power outage within the city during a severe winter weather event. Uh, factors will be on number of people affected and then the duration of the power outage. Uh, and then the other recommendations from uh, the emergency manager, the police watch commander, or the park street operation manager. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the annex addresses duties and responsibilities of key essential personnel. Uh, snow removal operations, law enforcement operations, fire department and EMS operations, rescue and shelter operations, the emergency fueling procedures and communication plan. Next slide. Uh, these are lessons learned over the last couple of years uh, and capability shortfalls that we have addressed. Uh, and, and Willis mentioned a couple of them earlier in his presentation. Uh, vehicles getting stuck in snow, uh, like I said, 27.1 inches fell in uh, March 2021 blizzard. Uh, what we found out is uh, PD uh, is equipping in that and we were getting, everybody was getting stuck. PD, public works, uh, it was just too much snow too quick. So what we've done to correct that is PD is equipping vehicles with snow chains, snow shovels, and rescue tow, tow straps. Uh, Public Works is replenishing and adding additional tire chains and rescue tow straps to their vehicles. Uh, second lesson I learned is people driving around barricades and road closure signs on East 96 Avenue and, and then getting stuck. This was a really big, as Willis mentioned, this was a really big uh, um, issue last year during that blizzard. So uh, we're, we're in, in the process of installing road closure gates and even just having a closed gate and barricades out there, people will still drive around uh, the barricades and gates. So we're gonna be, our, our plan is to need to put a traffic control unit at each end of the road closure to enforce um, the, to enforce the road closure. Uh, that will be staffed with non-PD or public works personnel, one to two personnel per vehicle with an EOC radio so we can maintain communication. Um, the, another lesson is lack of availability of fuel during a power outages. In the past, uh, when we would have a blizzard, we normally would get uh, maybe a possible power outages. Gas stations could be closed. Uh, if there is a power outage, they don't have the power backup generators to pump fuel. So last year, um, we, we went ahead and, and rented a, a mobile fuel dispensing station at the MSC, so we would be self-contained in case we had, you know, to uh, get fuel. I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but a snow plow is going 24 seven. And if you have a two or three day event, their, their fuel tanks, I believe is around 50 gallons and they're burning, they're probably going through a fuel tank every eight to 12 hours. Uh, so we go through a lot of fuel in a 24 hour fuel period. And that's why it's so important that we, uh, uh, we're in the process of purchasing a mobile fuel fuel dispensing station so we can be self-contained and not have to worry about uh, other locations to get fuel. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, no emergency backup power at the MSC. Uh, during a blizzard or a severe winter weather, the MSC is a major uh, um, um, asset. And, uh, and we identified that if, if we lost power, uh, they lose power to a lot of the operations over there and to the heat to their facilities. So we're in the process of uh, facilities in the process of installing emergency generators, which is a, a great asset to our response plan. And then no uh, dedicated rescue teams use, um, use park police or patrol uh, parks and street personnel. The important thing about their staffing, we're gonna be staffing four designated rescue teams, two for the north, two for the south, with tow straps and shovels. So if we uh, have a stranded motorist, we'll be able to assist them. The important note here is snow removal personnel need to be concentrated on their primary mission of snow removal and not rescuing non-emergent stranded motorists. Uh, need personnel from other departments to assist in staffing these teams. Last year, we had so many people stranded on East 96 and other parts of our city that they were uh, and that we needed to rescue. That it was pulling away from the, the we had to utilize uh, staffing from Public Works, Parks, and PD, which was pulling away 
their their primary mission, which was removing snow. So this year we're going to be utilizing and tapping into other um, uh, departments to assist in our staffing needs. Next slide, please. And then I uh, just want to keep you guys informed. Uh, current capability shortfalls is our shelter and operations for our city. The city has no city uh, has no shelter facilities designed um, uh, for shelter operations. Both our rec centers are des designated as emergency shelters. The current concerns are they don't have any, uh, emergency backup power or heat. So when they would lose, if we would lose power. Now you have a shelter with no power, no heat, and people stranded in it. And that's not a, a, a safe situation. Uh, our, our rec centers aren't, uh, they're not designed for shelter operations. So security access control and feeding will be a challenge, uh, especially if it's over a couple of days. And then we have lack in certified staff trained uh, in shelter operations and limited shelter supplies and equipment on hand. This is one of the areas that we have to address uh, as a city and, um, and, uh, and come up with some solutions for um, doing that. So, and that could be more, and I could provide more information on possible um, uh, options for that at a, a later presentation if uh, city council desires to do that. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, Willis, uh, that is it for our presentation. So is there any questions from the mayor or city council members? Anybody on council have any questions for either Willis or Mr. Dominic for this presentation? Councilman Wadiola. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you guys for the presentation. Um, just to your last point, I definitely want to get more information on emergency shelters. I think that's a big void in our city, and if you could come up with some recommendations, options that you know of, I would. Uh, I think it would be a bit a good thing for the city. So. Um, yeah, that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Council Member Hurst. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> great presentation. I just have a couple questions. Um, so obviously we talk about growth a lot um, and some of that growth is occurring on priority two roads, how we would be looking at them today. <clears throat> First of all, you guys do, you know, we do have a plan to update um, all those snow roads, all, all those new roads, I guess, in the, in the snow plan moving forward, I'd assume. But if a, pro, if, a, if a, you know, class two or class three storm happens, we only have so many resources. I completely understand that. Do we um, do a couple things? Do we allow for, do we have any IGAs that we're paying other agencies to help? Are we receiving any money from, from say, Adams County or CDOT? Um, you know, is it, back and forth on kind of those connected um, roads. I know we have some interesting road road uh, ownership, <laughs> like say 104th from Highway 2 to Highway 85. Um, are those just agreements? Uh, are, are we following strict boundary lines on ownership? Um, and how does that impact our operation? But the other thing is when it comes down to these uh, more significant storms, class two or three, would we or do we allow businesses to pay contractors to get the road back open? And I mean, some, some essential businesses need to be going about the same time as, as uh, our plows are really focused on the priority one roadways. Um, is that an issue? Have we come across that issue? Has anybody asked for that solution to be presented? Would be uh, my first question. So council member Hurst, good question. Um, so let me address the uh, IGAs. We do have some interesting areas as you as you mentioned, and we do work in conjunction with Adams County and CDOT, uh, actually Denver down in the south region of the of this city as well, uh, where we have overlapping areas where we're obviously in a class two, class three storm. Uh, if we're traveling through that area and it's not necessarily our little section, like on 104th, but we have to get to Bell Creek from uh, the reunion area, we're coming through there. We're going to go ahead and assist them. They're doing the same thing with us. Um, you know, 470 actually does the same thing when they come out and move around. If they come out uh, up and down 88th or, or 96th, uh, they're, they're dropping their plows and running them uh, during those bigger storm events. The smaller events, storms, we're usually doing turnarounds and, and sticking toward our boundaries. Um, so that's kind of how that, <clears throat> that works right now. I don't know that we're receiving any uh, funding from any other agencies at this point. Um, and then to... Uh, speak to your last question there. Uh, 
the city does not have a program. We have not worked out anything with any private business owners uh, to this point, that, to my knowledge, where we've actually uh, had it to where they're opening up uh, roadways within the city that are um, already accepted and in the responsibility of the city. Now, uh, you're talking, if you're talking in some of the new areas, uh, there's a period of time between when the road is uh, built out and when it's accepted. And so obviously before the city accepts it, the private contractors are, or the developer is responsible for that. Um, so there's a little bit of that up front, but moving forward after that acceptance is not uh, something that I'm aware of that has been done in the past. Uh, I've been uh, over the streets operations for uh, just about two years now. I uh, just still kind of finding out some of these little weird things about uh, intergovernmental agreements here and there, but I've not come across that. And I know we would be concerned uh, somewhat of, you know, just making sure that um, there were agreements in place and, and some sort of, uh, agreements on if they bring in a giant loader, for instance, and start running through the area and they start taking out curb and gutter, right? That's a, that's a costly repair that needs to be taken care of at the back end. So there'd be some concerns with that. Uh, I know during the blizzard and multiple other large blizzard type events in the past, there have been contractors out doing that. If we come across that and we see them doing something um, blatantly uh, unsafe, like stacking snow in the middle of roadways where cars are gonna come up and uh, you know come to an immediate stop when they hit those, um, or uh, plowing over the tops of curbs and gutters, causing damage stuff, we would stop and talk to them. Otherwise, it's kind of, you know, in the middle of the storm, we kind of just allow that to happen as it's going on. But it, uh, it's not typically done inside of uh, metro districts other than a few areas that have their um, alleyways and whatnot that are private, and they're, they're doing that. So some in some of those, we do see the contractor that'll, you know, as a courtesy kind of extend and, and push through, but uh, nothing formal formal at this point. Yeah, perfect. I, I was really only thinking of IGAs from the perspective of, you know, protecting the city and, and our assets, because I think it's great. I mean, obviously, in emergency situations like a class three storm, uh, you know, agreements to help each other doesn't necessarily need to come with cash exchange. It just, uh, you know, more of a, if I make a mistake, here's the process we're going to we're going to go through to um, from a, like a, the insurance process. Right. Somebody comes and takes out a light pole. It's not one of our employees. That's a tough, that's a tough position to be in, right? Because you're just trying to help and you're just trying to uh, kind of have mutual agreement. So just, just come at it from that angle. I uh, want to make sure that we're protected. I'm all for helping Denver when we're going through or helping CDOT and we, you know, they help us. I think that's great in those situations. Just don't want us to uh, be in that sticky spot where someone makes a mistake and we're, we're, uh, having to pick between us and them because we should pick us every time. Certainly. Council Member Noble. Uh, I support uh, Council Member Gardiola's suggestion about uh, he was piggybacking on your idea for doing something more for folks who get stuck in the snow. I also see the shortfall for um, the homeless in uh, Commerce City also, not just snow but also cold and uh, hopefully we'll be able to address that as well in the next year. Uh, this was really an interesting report. I was um, wondering also one of the uh, big warehouses in the new uh, Nexus area was commenting about having uh, their roads plowed because of needing to get their um, product you know, out, out of the warehouses and so forth. Where do you place that on the priority list? And what are you doing to work with those companies? Uh, so I believe the, the gentleman that you're talking to, uh, you know, he was referred to over to our department and um, our director and myself uh, met with him and, and kind of went over our overall plan and kind of some of the conditions that led to the uh, little bit of extended closure that he experienced during the March blizzard, right? Again, 27 inches of snow. Um, it was it was lots of our resources that were pulled to do other things other than regular snow removal uh, tasks that would be done in a class one, two, or three storm, right? Once we get to above that class three storm in the, into a national weather service advisory type category, blizzards, um, those types of events, uh, so those designations and, and the emergency snow plan or the uh, extreme weather winter weather plan calls for us to adjust and to uh, refocus priorities on the ground as needed, right? So um, 
So there's a couple of things that are going on in that particular area that will uh, hopefully make it easier for us to service the area. And one of those is uh, in March, that was a uh, one access in and out of that subdivision because 80, uh, it's going to be 80, fourth there was not allowed or was completely open onto tower road so uh now that we have we'll have a giant loop there or a little bigger loop there that we can come in and access from multiple directions so that should actually make it easier for us to plow and maintain and those roads have been added onto the the snow plan with the priority designations um they're currently at designation two so that would that's a pretty high level of service during most storms uh he should not be facility disruptions during uh, <coughs> and then um you know, lastly is we have to prioritize when we're in those major storm classifications or major weather events uh, we're classifying we're prioritizing you know what traffic do we need to get in and out and where do we need to get emergency services to first and foremost and then um, if we open up all the residential roads or all the uh, access for big semis to get out onto out onto tower road but tower road's not completely open and Pena boulevard's shut down it kind of really doesn't it doesn't do anybody any good to focus our resources there right so it's a prioritization uh, that's adjusted real time to on the ground conditions, and uh, we get them back up and running as soon as as soon as possible. Uh, you know, during that during that blizzard, we did have uh, a backhoe that was stuck during rescue operations that kept us from being able to dig out other operation uh, other areas through the city. We had several of the uh, vehicles, the one ton trucks, that got stuck and were abandoned for a period of time uh, during the storm because of the rescue operations that we talked about, right? So, so some of the things that we are doing to address that is hopefully minimizing rescue operations that take place by uh, having those barricades and having people man them and not allow folks around there to where we don't get into, uh, we need to go in and get somebody to, for their safety. Well, I have full faith that you uh, all have it under control. That was a great presentation, but I can't let you go without telling us the name of that gorgeous dog behind you, Dominic, that's a beautiful cream retriever. <laughs> That's a he, great he wins the background tonight. That's a great Pyrenees, and he's my oh, big, Pyrenees. big Wow. My big boy. And what's the name? T Tundra. Tundra. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Beautiful dog. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hurst. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. I I, uh, I apologize for being on mute. I, I think just to kind of build on what Councilwoman Noble was saying, that's what I was suggesting. Some of those class two roads can be on businesses that um, can be essential, if you will, during a storm. And I, I'll just say that I've I've uh, paid somebody to plow Dallas Street before because 96 was open, but Dallas wasn't. So um, I. I uh, that's all I'm suggesting is sometimes uh, in these emergency situations, uh, we should be a little flexible as long as nobody's out there, um, you know, tearing down signs and tearing up um, curb and gutter because it could actually be a help to us. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you both this evening for uh, your presentation. Thank you to everybody for the hard work and uh, please stay safe out there and uh, we will be counting on you to continue to make our streets safe for all of our residents. Um, looks like we are gonna move on to reports, Mr. Tinklenberg. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um wanted to let you know that uh, a couple of you reported uh, street lights being out on Highway 2, and the cause of that has been the uh, theft of wiring that connects those, those uh, street lights to power. And so, uh, again, we're having to have the um, utility replace the wire, and uh, uh, unfortunately, that's a event that's happening um, in many different areas. Um, there was a complaint about speed limit on 96th Avenue, uh, south of um, Frontera, and uh, in the South Park area reunion. So basically from Landmark West to Chambers. Um, in uh, studying that, the uh, Public Works uh, decided that uh, 
that actually should be a 40 mile an hour uh, speed limit zone. The, the rest of 96th Avenue is 45 mile an hour. So uh, uh, unless we hear of other objections uh, that will be changed uh, here in the near future. And then as I mentioned last week, uh, council orientation, we're spreading that out over multiple sessions so that newly elected members are not deluged with all of that material in one or two sessions, uh, which happened in 2019. And uh, you know there was a comment about something not being covered. It actually was in the, the uh, binder for 2019. But again, you know, there's so much material that's uh, covered so quickly that uh, it's understandable that that would not be remembered. And then uh, wanted to check in with you regarding the conversion from iPads. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, have given any thought to switching to these two-in-one laptops. So it'd be a laptop that has a uh, touch screen. Uh, so you can you know, use your finger to, to maneuver between uh, uh, applications and that type of thing like you would on your iPad. But then we would also provide a docking station and a 20, I think it's a 23 inch screen that would go with it so that you can have you know, multiple items up and be able to still use uh, your laptop like, like an iPad. So uh, unless we hear objections, we're gonna go ahead and, and order those uh, starting now because it's gonna be tough to get those. Um, Justin's latest estimate is that they would be arriving in January. So that's, that's uh, how backed up they are on ordering materials. And then moving on to uh, community development, I uh, wanted to let you know that the emergency rental assistance is at 1,137,000 as obligated for that. So reaching the limit on that and uh, the next 1.3 million is available um, shortly as well. And uh, for economic development, uh, several of us attended the Lowe's ribbon cutting today, Mayor Houston gave welcoming remarks and uh, we were able to meet with employees, both of Lowe's and, and uh, the operator of the facility to formally open the facility. Um, and then Parks Recreation Golf, a uh, reminder that the run with the Buffalo is on November 20 and cereal with Santa is on December 11. That was switched from the first Saturday in December so that it would not conflict with the uh, Adams 14 event like it did in 2019. But now it sounds like they switched as well. So not sure what's happening there. Uh, police did a uh, targeted enforcement for unregistered and expired uh, registration on vehicles. And they have written over 500 citations between October 18 and the 23rd. So a lot of citations for that. Uh, public works, number of uh, project updates. Uh, 88th Avenue, the CDOT director signed the uh, finding of no significant impact, the FONSI. And so the final design is now moving forward and they're working on a raise grant that will go in for that project. Uh, pavement management, uh, again, completed except for uh, some of the uh, remaining work on 88th Avenue and Jasmine, and I'll talk about Jasmine in a minute. Uh, 120th Avenue and US 85 Interchange, uh, staff has met with uh, CDOT and FHU, the design team, and uh, that was to discuss the Chrissy grant for that project. And uh, they're also processing uh, an IGA with both Adams County and Brighton, uh, so that project can move forward uh, as it uh, as progress is made. I-270 corridor and Vasquez, uh, the IGA with Adams County, that was approved by council. It's now been signed and returned to Adams County and uh, staff is holding scoping meetings with CDOT. Uh, Rosemary Widening, staff met with the fire chief to resolve concerns uh, and staff continues to work on property acquisition for drainage. And then uh, Jasmine reconstruction uh, start work started last week and is estimated to take three weeks to uh, install 
drainage, curb and gutter, and uh, pavement. Uh, free landfill day. Uh, this is the fi final free landfill opportunity, and it will be on Saturday, November 6th. So that's coming up. If you have stuff to haul away, that would be a good day to do it. Uh, mobile fuel unit, uh, as mentioned earlier in the uh, snow emergency plan, uh, staff has ordered uh, mobile diesel and gasoline tanks so that we can continue fueling our equipment. Uh, it'll be a 2000 gallon diesel tank and that'll arrive on November 15 or thereabouts, that's the estimated date, and a thousand gallon gasoline tank, which would be necessary for the police cars, uh, anticipated to arrive January 15. Uh, long lead time on those tanks. Uh, MSC generators, as mentioned earlier, the installation is continuing on those. And then uh, facility assessment projects. We gave you a whole list of facility assessment uh, projects that needed to be done somewhere on an emergency basis. Uh, those projects are underway. And uh, so work is, is uh, happening on multiple of those projects. Adams Tower, uh, there will be floor layout options that will be presented to council on November 22. Graffiti removal continues. Uh, for example, they had to remove graffiti three times in Frontera Park in the past week. Uh, and then all the standard fall work that has to be done. There are winterizing irrigation systems, winterizing equipment, uh, doing crack filling, asphalt, and concrete repair, all of that type of work. That is it for my uh, overview report. And if we could move to the agenda review. Dylan, if you would pull that up. All right, so November 1 is uh, really budget. So um, Obviously, there's a lot of uh, meeting minutes that need to be approved, but uh, Urban Renewal Authority will have a uh, meeting to adopt a budget. And then we will have the NIGID, ECAGID, and the ERAGID all adopting their budgets. So what you will do in those, same thing for a city council meeting, um, you will continue, you've continued the public hearing, and so you would, uh, ask if there's any additional comments regarding those budgets. And then uh, once comments are completed, you'll close the public hearings and vote on the uh, adoption of those budgets. So November 1 uh, city council meeting, uh, again, the uh, environmental planning and uh, we reinserted oil and gas to make sure everybody knows that includes oil and gas. Uh, so that'll be the monthly update. And then, uh, also, uh, there's a number of items on consent agenda. One is the social media policy. Uh, also, a resolution appointing the interim city attorney and approving an employment agreement. A uh, resolution awarding a contract for replacement of Peoria Street Bridge over the Little Burlington Ditch. And a resolution awarding contract for replacement of Brighton Road Bridge over the Fulton Ditch. And then you have a public hearing. Um, that one is for the budget. And you have an ordinance on first reading, and that's for an amendment of the 2021 budget. And that's for uh, a JAG burn grant for police department equipment. And then uh, also uh, there was the request for an appointment of a council member to the Rocky Mountain Partnership. And then following that would be the uh, executive session uh, regarding the um, evaluation, um, and I'm the only only one left to evaluate at this point, so that would be for um, that process. Uh, November 8, uh, we had some items on there that got moved off, so I, I'm sure there's going to be something else popping up that will uh, repopulate that meeting, and then November 15, of course, is another regular meeting, and the big item there is the continuation of, of that uh, 112th Avenue and US 85 project, uh, which will be coming back to you for your consideration. Um, the other item is on the consent agenda and that was establishing that 
$500 minimum penalty for littering and improper dumping. Any questions on any of those meetings? <clears throat> Doesn't look like it, sir. All right, thank you. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Tinklenberg concerning his report? Seeing none, just one quick reminder that tomorrow is the deadline for submitting administrative council business for the November 1st meeting. Mr. Tinklenberg, or excuse me, Mr. Sheasley. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. Um, the thing I wanted to report tonight is that, as you know, you have the executive session during the special meeting. I presented something by email today. So if there's no disagreement with that, you don't need to proceed with the executive session. We'll take that to just put what was presented on the on the uh, meeting for next week. Um, but otherwise, we can have the executive session. And then to follow up on the request by council for a petition to the Water Quality Control Commission, regarding a prior rulemaking is currently being researched uh, for various legal issues, among them mostly procedural at this point. So we want to confirm that we're in the proper place to do that. Um, and that's my report this evening. Thank you. Councilmember Noble. Yes, I had a question for Mr. Tinklenberg. Um, can the uh, city council be involved in the orientation of new council members? Uh, the meeting is scheduled for five o'clock before city council meetings. And that's usually when we have the legislative meetings. That's when board of commissions happens. That's when a variety of uh, meetings occur that might conflict. Um, I, I think that the Friday night or Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever it was that we did actually wasn't a problem. Um, the problem is, is that we get this huge notebook that's a binder with lots of things in it that we don't know uh, are important or what we should be looking at. And uh, certainly council members uh, Grimes, Guardiola and myself have learned a whole lot about the council policies that are in that binder through the policy and governance committee. So there are things that should be addressed. And as I mentioned at a previous meeting, I would uh, love for actually the city council to do a session as well, so that they can, um, you know, people can weigh in on, on what they found to be uh, the most important things that they wish they would have known. Thanks. Well, what, we, what we've what we proposed is uh, actually 10 sessions and those have been uh, scheduled out on the calendar going, uh, forward starting on November 22 would be the first one at five o'clock. And so what we can do actually, now that November 8 is empty, we could uh, cover that schedule with you with the topics that are, are scheduled for each one of those. And uh, you know have, have your comments and input on that. That would certainly be welcome. Um, in terms of teaching, we're open on that. I mean, we have people lined up for these various topics, but again, um, it's your business, your people. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, however you guys want to uh, organize it, uh, you know, we're trying to do our best, but certainly open to your direction. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that two years ago the council wanted to participate. Uh, when new members came on and we as we've discussed before we may have is we know we'll have one new member and we might have as many as four you know that would be the most but um it would be nice if we were all on the same page again plus it's a way for us to um to get together so even november 22nd you were thinking doing it before a new member is installed uh, November 8 is when we could talk about the uh, schedule and the topics. And then okay. no November 22 is when we uh, tentatively scheduled the first orientation session. And by then the uh, election should be certified. But again, you know, if, if, if not, we could push that back, certainly. Okay, thank you. Yes, I would like to have some involved. Councilmember Madera. 
No, I kind of like the way that we did it, you know, when I was elected, where we spread it out in study sessions and did, you know, every study session, there was one topic that was covered and it lasted a while, but it was, you know, kind of bite-sized information that you can digest and actually absorb as opposed to, you know, because I looked at the book from 2019 and it was all the same information. It was just a lot more condensed and trying to learn all that in in one sitting is, is impossible for anybody. You know, you're going to forget something. So, you know, I kind of like that approach that we did back in 2017, where it was spread out in study sessions and we were all together as well. So, you know, existing council members and, you know, the new council members were all being given the same information and, and discussing those same topics. So, because, you know, given the option of going through the, the same training and, uh, you know, giving up a, a Friday evening or a Saturday, I might be inclined to, to skip, but, you know, if they're in steady sessions and spread out, then I think that's easier for everyone to, to be involved in. Any other questions or comments for either Mr. Tinklenberg or Mr. Sheasley? Seeing none, do any other council members wish to make a report at this time? Council Member Noble. Thank you very much, Mayor Huseman. Um, I wanted to give um, a shout out uh, to one of my constituents who's a member of the Cultural Commission um, Rana Sanchez won a $14,000 grant for the commission. And I think that was a very special thing for a volunteer to do. Um, also, we met with the, uh, Mayor Huseman and I met with what's known as the Water Commission. I asked about uh, the bills that some people had a big um, spike in. And uh, they said that there's always about 100 customers every summer at the end of round every summer that this happens and to always check with them and they'll come out and take a look at it. If you're having any questions regarding taste issues or anything like that, they will also come to your home and uh, test your water. So keep that in mind as well. Um, Councilwoman Alan Thomas and I were uh, with the senior commission and uh, they re reiterated the plan for safe housing for seniors and uh, we'll be laying out a plan for that. That hasn't happened yet. And then uh, uh, Councilwoman Alan Thomas and the city manager and myself were at uh, Denver International Airport for a meeting to meet with Bill Washington and others. And uh, they are trying to expand efforts to build a pipeline of workers from young ages through education and training. Uh, they anticipate enormous expansion of the airport and of flights. And um, uh, council member Hurst had asked about emissions from flights. Uh, they said that those remain a question, but that airplanes are always um, uh, upgrading and are working on improving the emissions. And finally, the, um, uh, all of their ground crews will be going electric over a very quick period here. And they're trying to, uh, uh, find alternatives to Suncor at this time. Um, and then, of course, as Mr. Tinkerberg said, we were at uh, the Lowe's NFI uh, warehouse ribbon cutting today with um, Mayor Huseman. Great remarks today, Mayor Huseman. You had multiple applauses. So uh, thank you, everyone. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Councilman Wadiola. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just want to echo one of the shout outs for Rana Sanchez. Uh, we had our annual cultural council retreat that went very well at Bison Ridge um, all day Saturday. Uh, this group is doing an amazing job. Um, they do have some asks that I'll be uh, putting through with council. Um, so look forward to those um, later on this year. Or uh, So uh, Youth Commission, it's in a transition stage. We're still recruiting. Um, it's been hard with COVID and students, uh, so we're just trying to recruit. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Any other reports to give? 
Seeing none, um, my report would just echo what other people said was at NFI Lowe's today. A uh, phenomenal facility, great to have them as part of our community um, and continue to grow uh, our presence in the global supply chain market. Um, also at the Water Commission meeting, um, which uh, was pretty informative. Um, I want to send a congratulations to the Colorado Rapids. They won Saturday night in their match against the uh, Portland um, and uh, secured themselves a playoff position in the MLS Cup. So I think if they get one or two more wins over the next three games, I think they secure a home playoff game, which would be great to have here in Commerce City. Um, so congratulations to them and all the players for all their hard work in, in securing a playoff position. That is the extent of my remarks for that. So we will adjourn from the study session and move into the special meeting of the city council. We'll call that to order and ask the city clerk to call the roll. Mayor Huseman. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Frank. Present. Council member Madera. Present. Council member Alan Thomas. Present. Council member Noble. Present. Council member Wardiola. Present. Council member Hurst. Present. Council member Grimes. Present. Council member Smith. Mayor Huseman, you have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, I'm looking for a motion and a second to excuse those members not present. Council Member Madera. So moved. Council Member Alan Thomas. Second with the motion. I have a motion and a second to excuse those members not present. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, do a voice vote. All those in favor, please use physical hands in the chat window. That's going to pass unanimously eight to zero with one absence. All right, we now have an administrative business item to take action on the QCF request. Does anybody on council wish to make a motion? Council Member Madera. Yeah, I'll make the motion to ratify the QCF vote. Can you give me a little bit more context on that, please? Uh, to remove the, the board member as a uh, Thank you. And Council Member Noble. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second to ratify the vote of the Quality Community Foundation, which would remove Director Barnett from the Board of Directors of the Quality Community Foundation. Is there any discussion? Council Member Hurst. Yeah, I think just request uh, to, to fellow council members that if we uh, go this direction, that we don't just push this aside that we have to at least ensure that um, what we've learned or what, you know, all, all that's been passed to us in this conversation, um, they can't be looked away because, you know, you, you, you could change the context or, um, you know, some of the details for lots of other different reasons. And we absolutely should be involved um, in removing somebody and understanding the reasons for it. Um, and so I just want to make sure that, that you know, we're all considering um, all that's been learned and we move forward from there. Any other uh, council member Wadiola? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, this is a learning lesson for the city, for our boards and commissions. Um, and uh, in our retreat, uh, you know, they have certain bylaws that have different steps. Um, QCF, hopefully they will go back and put different steps in because again, I think we have to learn from this and uh, we don't have policy in that. So I hope this council takes it another notch and starts looking at all our boards and commissions. And I know I had a conversation with Roger to see if we could get one individual that oversees all our boards and commissions. So stuff like this doesn't come all the way to us and there's proper due process steps. Um, so I would echo that council member first. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. I just um, want to voice, and I've voiced it several times, I think it's just still very sad that, you know, we gave direction to have a meeting um, and that that meeting never happened. Um, and, you know, that was voiced again tonight. And I just, I, I find it incredibly frustrating that I feel like this should have been resolved in July. And, and it, it probably never would have escalated to this point. And so I'm just incredibly frustrated. Um, I think there's definitely truths on both sides. Um, I'm not saying that one person is completely right or the other one's completely right. Um, but I do think that, you know, some of the issues that, um, that were brought up, if, if they are true, um, 
there's definitely some concerning things that are happening on QCF. Um, so that's all I wanna say. I just wish that the meeting would have happened back in July when it was directed for that meeting to happen. Councilmember Noble. I'm supporting this strictly um, because of the vote among uh, the foundation members. And I am respecting the vote of the foundation members. It is incumbent upon um, uh, boards and commissions perhaps to help uh, provide due process so that that is taken care of in the future so that there's no confusion. But I am uh, supporting the vote to the QCF. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Noble again. That was an accident, I apologize. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none. Um, I, uh, as I reiterated in the um, joint meeting between us and the QCF, I'm disappointed that this is the position that we've been put in. Um, I uh, certainly wish that uh, things had been handled differently so that we didn't reach this point. Um, I'm in a difficult position. I know both individuals that are uh, at the crux of this uh, disagreement on a personal basis and uh, don't like being put in a position where I have to choose between two individuals. Therefore, um, I request uh, the ability from council to recuse myself from this vote. I uh, don't wanna be in a position where I have to choose one individual over another. Any objections to that recusal? And then, great. We'll go ahead and do a voice vote. All those in favor of uh, removing the individual from the QCF, please use your physical hands in the chat window. And looks like that is going to pass five to three with uh, council member. I'm sorry, do that one more time for me. Five to two with council member Hurst and Mayor Pro Tem Frank being the no votes, myself being an abstention, and council member Smith being an excused vote. All right. Um, next up, we are going to move on to an execution of extension of a tolling agreement. Does anybody on council have any questions for the city attorney regarding this action? Seeing none, council member Noble. Do you want the questions now or after, will there be another presentation and, or can we ask questions after the community speaks? Um, this is an extension of the tolling agreement with uh, Dave Hammer and his property. This is not on the uh, development agreement. Gotcha. Are there any questions at this time for the city attorney? Mr. Tinklenberg? I can give a real quick overview if that would be helpful. I think that would be helpful. Thank you, sir. All right. So, Roger, I mean, given that it's about potential litigation, um, if there are questions, I'd kind of like to handle those unless you want to talk about the status of development discussions. I was just going to give uh, a quick overview of what this is regarding. Okay. Would you mind if I did that then? Go for it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, about a year ago, council initially authorized a tolling agreement that would suspend the um, the statute of limitations essentially for a claim that a landowner believes he has against the city and the water district. Um, this doesn't acknowledge or admit the claim in any way and the city would defend that and I believe has substantial defenses to it. Um, this just uh, allows the continuing discussions for the property to annex into the city to continue without the uh, threat or interference of litigation. Thank you, sir, for that. Does anybody on council have any questions regarding that? Seeing none, I am looking for a motion and a second to authorize the city attorney to sign the extension of the tolling agreement. Council Member Grimes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I move to authorize the city attorney to sign the extension of the tolling agreement. Thank you, Council Member Hurst. Second. I have a motion and a second to authorize the city attorney to explain the extension of the tolling agreement. Is there any discussion? Seeing no request for discussion, looking for a voice vote. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand in the chat window. That's going to pass eight, eight to zero with one absence. 
All right, next up, we have a presentation. Um, before we go into the presentation, we've been at this for a couple hours. Let's go ahead and take a uh, five minute recess and uh, use facilities if you need to get some to drink. And then we'll move into the remainder of our present or uh, agenda.
All right, looks like everybody's back. So we'll get into the rest of our agenda. We have a presentation up next on the Reunion Consolidated Development Agreement. Mr. Tinklenberg, would you please provide the introductory remarks? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a real quick overview. There's uh, really two, two separate questions, although they're related, they're interrelated. Uh, <clears throat> the first question is, <clears throat> pardon me, is regarding the continuation of the development agreement. The reason the original development agreement was set up is uh, this project, the whole reunion development involves thousands of acres and um, you know, was anticipated to take uh, decades to, to implement basically. And we've seen, you know, it's it's lasted for 20 years, and approximately half of the land has been developed, and so there's a significant amount of land left, and they would like to continue with that framework. Um, what the agreement set up is, you know, since this is a master developed or master plan development, it uh, gives them a structure to operate within so that they can uh, plan for their multiple uh, individual developments that are going to occur and uh, basically plan out, uh, well, develop the whole business plan and plan out the financing for uh, all of those va various phases that occur. So I understand why they're asking for, you know, continuation of the development agreement or an extension of it, or you know, a new revised agreement to replace the old one. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense. There's no obligation that the city has that the city council is obligated, uh, you know, to extend that agreement. I think it's uh, just from a practical standpoint, it makes sense. It's uh, a much different situation than you have with a couple hundred acre development, for an example. Uh, because here we're you're talking you know over a thousand acres left yet to be developed. A separate but related uh, agreement and issue is the continuation or extension of the sales and use tax reimbursement agreement. That agreement was put in place to uh, basically reimburse uh, the Reunion Metro District for work that was going to be done in conjunction with their development. And that would be work that uh, would be for uh, basically the, the general public good. Uh, and so the idea was that the city would reimburse uh, basically 33% of the 3% sales and use tax. Uh, and even though our, you know, our total sales tax at the time was uh, three and a half percent and now is at four and a half percent. Um, they were proposing to continue that, that same percentage. Uh, this time around, it would be uh, for a much more defined list of projects. And uh, so it uh, you know, would, would have a, a more defined outcome uh, than the previous agreement did, which was quite honestly a little bit on the loose side. It, it really didn't define what projects. The main big one that they did was uh, 104th Avenue improvements in the area of Reunion, um, basically east of Chambers, uh, that area around Landmark and uh, Tower Road in that area. Um, and again, I, I would say the same thing about this agreement. Uh, you are under no uh, ethical, legal, moral obligation to extend that uh, sales and use tax uh, revenue sharing agreement. It uh, does put the onus on them to develop a certain number of projects and uh, puts the risk on them that they would uh, receive enough uh, sales and use tax revenue and building permit revenue uh, to reimburse them for the costs that, that they incur. But um, you know, the other option for us is to not deal with extending the revenue sharing agreement and instead rely on 
uh, city tax money, or in the case of the NIGID, if the voters approve ballot measure 6A and 6B, uh, 6A would allow uh, a broadening of the authority to use that tax revenue. Currently, that tax revenue is restricted to paying off bonds only. Um, 6A would broaden that to allow ongoing capital projects such as building out roads like uh, Chambers Road, 96th Avenue, that type of thing, um, as well as building uh, additional parks, drainage facilities, uh, police substation, you know, a variety of public improvements that are needed in, in the growing area. Um, 6B would, would allow uh, the issuance of up to 295 million of bonds, uh, but again, those would be uh, limited by the amount of revenue that's available at any given time. And so those would have to be phased in as projects are able to be funded, uh, or I should say, as the bonds are able to be funded uh, to be repaid basically out of tax revenue. So it, it's a bit of a chicken and egg question. You know, do we uh, proceed without renewing the sales and use tax revenue sharing agreement and pin our hopes on the NIGID ballot measures uh, passing? Or uh, do we you know, just basically realize that we have to use general fund revenues uh, if we're not sharing those revenues with the Reunion Metro District, then we do have additional revenue that otherwise would have gone to the Reunion Metro District that we then would have available to pay for projects. And we take on that obligation completely as a city. Um, so if, if the NIGID ballot measures fail this fall, um, as of November 2, then I would recommend that we analyze, you know, the reasons for that and uh, bring it back to the voters, but this time do an extensive education program uh, prior to placing it on the ballot. Um, because once it's placed on the ballot, I cannot spend uh, city staff resources or money on it. And so if you recall, we placed it on the ballot and uh, from that point on could not basically involve our resources in promoting it. So uh, if that were to come to pass, if it failed, then, then I think there's a path forward, but it would be bringing those questions back to the voting public uh, at a later year, whether it's next year or two years from now, you know, that would be a decision for council to make. So again, I wanna emphasize, there is no obligation to proceed with either agreement. Uh, the I think there's practical reasons why it makes sense to continue with the development agreement. And then it really comes down to, you know, what's your preferred approach in funding public projects that are desperately needed, but uh, have to be funded in some way somehow. So those are my introductory remarks and happy to answer any questions about that. Councilmember Member Madera. Do we have a, um... The numbers of, you know, how much we've contributed, you know, or reimbursed based off of this tax, and then um, the amount that has been reinvested. So, you know, what's the multiplication factor of of entering into this agreement and sharing the tax, and then, you know, what's the value of the projects that come out of this? I'm looking to pull it up right now. Uh, staff did a report back in uh, September of 2020. Um, the staff member who updates that was out this past week. And so uh, we did not, and they were working on budget and audit before that. So we have not had an opportunity to update it, but um, through the second quarter of 2020, the uh, subtotal, Let's see, let me get on the right column here. So 
So, well, let me start with this. Year end of 2019, uh, there was a total of 10,934,000. And then uh, through uh, second quarter of 2020, there was an additional 175 or 179,000, sorry. And second quarter, 393,000. So grand total of that was uh, 11,500,000. Um, and their expenditures, let me see if I can find that real quickly here. The amount of, re, uh, of uh, expenditures that they showed for the projects that, that uh, were covered under the existing agreement was 34,400,000. So that's um, 11 and a half million in revenue shared with them compared to 34.4 million that they spent. So obviously not in balance. Yeah, so it more than doubles the impact of those taxes if by entering into this agreement, basically. Yes, keeping in mind that, you know, the future agreement will have a more uh, well-defined list of projects. And so uh, that affects that somewhat, but yes, uh, it, it multiplied investment, yes. So um, what, what kind of projects are in this uh, new agreement? So I had mentioned uh, Chambers Road, north of 104th Avenue. Um, also, there's Chambers Road south of 104th Avenue. Uh, there's phase three of 112th Avenue, which would take it to tower, and then phase four. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I don't remember. That must be east of tower then. Um, there's also phase two of 112th Avenue, which would be Potomac to Chambers. So that would be from the Recreation Center over to Chambers, basically. Uh, Landmark Drive, which uh, would be uh, south down to 96th Avenue. Um, Potomac Parkway, High Plains Parkway. High Plains Parkway will be a major uh, extension connecting between Tower Road and Buckley Road. So it, it would complete a major north-south route. Um, and then there's some additional projects, but th that was what was listed uh, here in 2020. Let me see if I can find that other list. There's also a, a stormwater detention uh, facility on, on uh, Second Creek near 112th. That's one I remember off the top of my head. And how much would it cost the city if we were doing this? you know, taking the tax money and doing it ourselves, do these projects. Well, that's how I came up with the 295 million for the bond issue for uh, 6B was the list of projects that needed to happen. And that, that, that did not include all of the projects that uh, Reunion had listed, uh, but it was all of the major projects, including a police substation. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Councilmember Noble. Thank you. Yes, I have questions too. Um, could you describe the difference between, um, say, a developer doing a road and a government doing a road? Is there a different approach in terms of um, letting it out for bid, for example? In this case, no, uh, because Reunion Metro District is a governmental entity. And so they, they would go through the same uh, basic process that, that we as a city uh, use, you know, taking bids and, and uh, doing the bid opening and that type of thing. Um, they have uh, an engineering firm that they work with on a regular basis. And so from that standpoint, they might be a little faster than us, quite frankly. 
but uh, otherwise, no, it's, it's uh, basically the same process since they're a governmental entity. How common is the practice of uh, giving back sales and use tax to a developer in Colorado? Could you cite other examples of this? I am not an expert on what other cities are doing, quite frankly. I, I don't know. Sorry, I can't answer that. I can certainly understand why this was critical and important when Shea Holmes came to North Commerce City. We were looking at vast expanses of nothingness, you know, just beautiful farm land, rolling hills, and no homes. Shea Holmes was taking a huge risk to come out here and build homes, let alone do commercial as well, because they were responsible for. Um, King Supers. So I think that people are wondering where, why, you know, what's the benefit for the city beyond the roads? Because the residents in this area were promised um, so much, and some of it hasn't come to pass. Uh, I could certainly see, for example, if um, uh, the developer or the master developer said, oh, we're doing reunion center. And I would suggest, oh, in that case, let's cut a deal with them that involves 1% of the sales and use tax for anything that is built in reunion center, as opposed to ongoing incentivization for all of the development that the current master developer had no um, influence over or played no role in. That's where I find uh, some of it to be an issue, but I'm, I'm more than happy to hear from other people and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from the community as well. So I want to ask you again, Mr. Uh, Mayor Huseman, are we asking questions of Mr. Tinklenberg right now and then we'll hear from the community and then we'll decide what to do or how is this arranged this evening? It's arranged this evening that right now we are discussing the presentation. We are discussing questions with the city staff. Following that, we will have the opportunity for citizen communication. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine individuals who have signed up for citizen communication. Following that, we have uh, the opportunity to enter into executive session for two different purposes. Okay, and so at that moment, then we decide what we're going to do, whether we are going to have those, because I would prefer to see the um, sales and use tax expire unless there are, um, there would have to be some major, major milestones and certainly milestones in the development agreement or if, if they don't meet those milestones, then it would be um, like an abrogation of the agreement somehow that we would, uh, you know, that expectations would meet, what they, what they do would meet our expectations. I think that would be really, really critical. This has been, of huge importance and a big topic in this area ever since I moved here almost nine years ago now. And um, it's it's been a big topic this week as well. So um, I really do look forward to hearing from everyone. I am, uh, as I said, I do have concerns. Council Member Hurst. Yeah, I think this is um, um, one area where we we can get some control. So I'm really happy to see at least that there is um, you know, specific projects, prioritized projects, ones that make sense from not just that, that local perspective, but to connect the regional perspective within our city. Um, I, I think any agreement moving forward, um, and I agree with Councilwoman Noble that, that it's, it is a di different setting than it was 20 years ago. Um, it's more defined. I think in the beginning, of a development like we looked at up north you kind of have an open landscape and there's a lot of untolds you know there's a lot of hope but you know there's there's also a lot of processes that have to take place before you start to define what the community is going to 
uh, end up looking like. And I think we're getting a lot closer. And now we're, we're able to kind of have that vision and that discussion about how this city um, can develop, you know, hold opportunities for the market to, to take um, to take place here. I think all of that is um, here. Here's a great time for us to, to ask for that. I, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that I have the full story yet on, you know, being able to walk away from um, having a fund that we can use to develop these projects. And what I mean is, I, I think a loosely, um, a loose contract that doesn't have any defining projects of how this money is going to be spent, you know, some kind of expectations that have to be met it is, is not a good plan for us moving forward. But if we are going to do this, not only have, you know, a defined plan moving forward with with those projects that that Roger you outlined as a starting point and, and hear back from our community on other opportunities for for enhancement that makes sense um i think then maybe we can as long as there's an audit process you know we, we talk about you know having a 10-year comp plan that we haven't fully fulfilled but but when did we review that and start to understand that i think it's a little too late to hit that first 10-year comp plan right so now everything that we see wrong with the, the last comp plan we're going to try to do moving forward. Okay, so let's just start defining like a two year audit process or an 18 month audit process, something like that, to where if we're going to move forward with this money, there's an accountability pro, uh, built into it that is pretty immediate. Um, so we're not lagging behind and we're not uh, having any issues um, seeing out the contract terms. And so uh, I, I think both the development agreement and the um, tax agreement has the possibility of being extended, but it has to ha has to be on terms that make sense for us in in the position of development that we're currently in, where we know what we kind of need and want now, and and be, we're ready to define that. And so I support that moving forward, um, whatever way best you know this group best decides that to happen. Any other questions at this time? Comments? Council Member Noble? Um, Mr. Tinkleberg? Yes, ma'am. When, uh, when a project is going in, um, uh, does the developer need to put in any of the roads themselves? That's a good question with a complicated answer. Um, you know, we were talking about the road impact fees earlier today, earlier this evening. There's a relationship between the road impact fees and what we fund with the general improvement districts. And so, uh, again, depending on the vote of the voters uh, for the NIJID, uh, we're going to have to go back and take a look at those road impact fees and how that relates to uh, the uh, projects that we would fund with, with the NIJID, for an example. And we have the two other general improvement districts as well. And, and we don't want to get into a position where we're double dipping, um, you know, where we're imposing an impact fee and then using the general improvement districts to fund the uh, same project, for an example. Um, so we have to look at that relationship to make sure that, that uh, while they're separate and distinct, uh, there is a relationship between them. In terms of the developer obligation, it comes back to uh, they have to contribute to arterial roadways that, that they're uh, going to be utilizing. And so that's the, the intent and purpose of impact fees. And uh, their obligation is to build the interior streets that are within their development. And then when they connect to these arterial and you know, collector roads, I'm using those terms very loosely. The engineers cringe when I use those technical terms, but um, you know, when we, when we uh, build those arterials, there's a certain contribution that they have to make. And so uh, you know, is it uh, via tax revenue or is it via impact fees? And so we have to be careful in that area. And I'm sure Robert can uh, talk about this far more in an articulate manner than I can. 
I, I do not know that's possible. I, I raised my hand um, to note that on the issue of double dipping, um, we're talking about two distinct fees when we're talking about the items that the GID collects, which is um, a tax, a property tax, it's an ad valorem tax, and then what's collected through the impact fees. And I'm sorry, and so, and in addition to the tax, then you have the sales and use tax that would go to general fund that would be, um, all could be diverted to, to pay for roads. On the other side, you have impact fees, uh, which as opposed to service fees, these are not taxes. These are um, generally applicable legislatively adopted fees that um, attempt to address impacts of a development through a standard formula, essentially. Um, otherwise, it could be done on a case-by-case -case basis for a development, um, but there are more significant constitutional restrictions when you're doing that. And so the city may be able to use tax money and impact fees to pay for the same um, projects, which is currently what's being done because of the, the deficiency in impact fees. It's really more of a policy decision as to whether you want to have multiple sources of revenue diverted to the same, um, the same future construction. Um, and so I, I, I hope that helps a bit and clarifies Roger's comments. I did have a follow-up on roads, which was that I had read uh, some of the materials and it appeared that um, roads that bordered these developments were also a commitment that they made. So um, I'm not suggesting the current master developer needed to do it. Perhaps the original needed to have done it. But for example, finishing um, 112th, at least the half of the road that borders um, reunion. Uh, that has been a um, tremendous problem for residents who live on there and get uh, the dirt kicked up on them as, um, as trucks head into new projects on 112th by the golf course. Um, do you have a, any thought on that, Mr. Sinklenberg? Yes. Um, you know, some areas uh, basically won't have a developer that will be contributing. And 112th Avenue is, is a prime example. There are residences in unincorporated Adams County, for example, that uh, basically will not be contributing to improving the street in front of their property. And so um, in the past, we have obtained some funding from Adams County uh, for for those properties, uh, but again, that's not a, a guaranteed thing or a sure thing, and so uh, you know, being able to use the general improvement district to uh, widen the entire road, it doesn't do any good to have you know one half of the road paved and the other half still gravel. I mean, that's even a worse situation. So uh, it makes sense to pave the entire street and improve it for drainage and all of those purposes. So. Um, Again, that, that would be a legitimate area where we could use tax revenue, uh, whether it's city or, or you know, one of the general improvement districts to pay for part of the improvement while impact fees you know, contribute to, to the other side that's next to the development, uh, in addition to what the developer's obligation is for that improvement. Yeah, I, th I think I was thinking about uh, the reunion uh, area and that uh, I don't, I can't remember if I saw it in the service plan or in another document or in the development agreement, but uh, roads bordering were their responsibility. And um, I'm just suggesting that perhaps that hasn't entirely been done. And I do have one other thought on this 1%. It has remained um, in my mind ever since it was brought up uh, at a recent meeting, a recent hearing actually, that um, uh, all the builders in this master develop, development are required to um, contribute uh, 800 plus dollars to Reunion Community Foundation. And the Reunion Community Foundation is not, that's not like a normal community foundation. It's not something that anybody knows about that is run by uh, Oakwood. And that money then is turned around and used um, 
for schools that Oakwood wants to do, such as um, um, the Stead School. Um, and I just, I'm just not comfortable with the partnership that we're seeing here. It seems to benefit the developer far more than it develop than it um, than it benefits livability in this area, and that um, our interests and theirs are not entirely the same. That people are expecting that um, developers should provide to the schools when it turns out they're operating a parallel effort. Um, that that complicates things. That makes it hard for people to be sympathetic and it makes it hard to do a vote that's supportive of this as well. Thank uh, you. If, if you I can address, sure. address the, uh, the fee for the Reunion Education Foundation, uh, that is in lieu of contributing to the 27J uh, Foundation. Uh, so they're they're still continuing to, you know, make uh, the same. I, I heard that it's actually more than the 27J um, voluntary fee. I, I don't know the truth of that. I don't know enough information about that. But uh, at any rate, they are contributing to schools that will be built in the reunion area, and those are 27J schools. So um, you know some residents were under the impression that they weren't contributing at all. And that's not the case. They are contributing. It's just being kept within the reunion area for 27J schools instead of going wherever else, Brighton, Thornton, you know, wherever schools are being built uh, elsewhere. And, and so it was their effort to target that money for schools that would be built in, in reunion. So that I, I think that really is a separate issue, but but just to address the perception issue, uh, it, it's not what people perceive to be the case. I do think that it would be worthwhile to have 27J answer that question because they were quite shocked that night to find it out. That was the first time they'd learned of it, Mr. Tinkleberg, and, and I don't think explaining Oakwood helps the situation here. Um, I know that they were um, were surprised. So if we're trying to have a partnership or are we trying to have a company town? And I think that's what we need to figure out here. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Tinglenberg? Seeing none, we did receive a presentation back on October 4th regarding this. Does anybody wish to see the presentation again? Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and move into citizen communication. For council policy, citizen communication cannot occur before the time stated in the agenda without council approval. The estimated time in the agenda for citizen communication was 7, 10 p.m. The time is now 8, 10 p.m. Therefore, no action needs to be taken. Tonight's citizen communication is only scheduled for comments on the reunion consolidated development agreement. If you're here to speak on other matters, please save your comments for the November 1st regular city council meeting and visit our website for information on how to speak during citizen communication at that meeting. The city needed advanced registration in order to participate in citizen communication for this meeting. If you're currently in this meeting to speak during citizen communication, please listen for me to call your name and the clerk will unmute you so you may begin. If you do not respond or are disconnected, you may miss your chance to comment. Please give your name and address for the record and keep your comments limited to three minutes. If a council member wants to ask a question, please ask to be recognized when the speaker is finished. First for the speaker this evening is going to be Renee Millard Chacon. Renee, if you're in the meeting, it can hit star nine on your phone or use the raise hand function in Zoom. Renee? Mayor Huseman, I do not see Renee in the meeting. Thank you. Next to be Brandon Fowler. Brandon, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. My name is Brandon Fowler and I live at 10801 Chambers Way. Regarding the extension of the Reunion Consolidated Development Agreement, I respectfully urge the City Council 
to allow this agreement to expire and to renegotiate an agreement that is in favor of the residents. As I understand it, this agreement was put into place 20 years ago as an incentive for development in the northern part of the city. Today, however, the north is well established and that incentive is no longer necessary. Furthermore, what has been promised by the developers and what they are actually delivering are not the same. I found a document from the reunion website that was posted in 2016 called Reunion Facts at a Glance. This document shows the reunion development plan had designated land use as 45% residential, 35% commercial, and 20% non-urban. That document was removed from the reunion website in 2019, which made me wonder if those facts were still true. I overlaid a recent development plan from Oakwood Homes, and guess what I found? They changed the plan. My estimates show that land use areas are now 57% residential, 29% commercial, and 14% non-urban. This suggests that developers may have taken land away from potential commercial and non-urban areas and increased residential areas by 12%. Why should the city extend a development agreement when the developers are clearly not delivering on their promises? This is an opportunity for you to show residents that you are making decisions in their best interests and not the developers. Last week, you all failed to do that when you voted to remove Ordinance 2354 from the City Council agenda. Mayor Ben made a passionate plea to keep the ordinance on the agenda, an ordinance introduced by Susan Noble that would have allowed residents to weigh in on new development projects. I want you all to know that within 24 hours, over 1,000 people watched that meeting on YouTube. It is now the most popular City Council video in the last seven years. And why do you think that is? It's because Mayor Ben spoke the truth and it resonated with residents. Regardless of its potential impacts, for those of you that voted against that ordinance, the community is now well aware of who you are. They see who contributes to your campaigns. They see that you are voting against them. Look, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't wanna be here. I've got kids in the other room that wanna play Nintendo right now. But here I am talking to a bunch of elected officials to make sure that they're doing what's right by our community. And I shouldn't have to do that. I am challenging all of you to demonstrate your commitment to this community. Let the agreement expire. Do not hide discussions behind closed doors and renegotiate something that is in favor of the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Does anybody on council have any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, we thank you for your time and your comments this evening. Next up is Ramon Alvarado. Ramon, if you're in the meeting, you can hit star nine on your phone or use the raise hand function in Zoom. Ramon. Ramon, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Ramon, are you there? Mayor Huseman, it looks like Ramon is having technical difficulties. Thank you. We'll circle back to him if we can get that situated. Next up is Rana Sanchez. Rana, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Uh, <clears throat> Rana Sanchez, 10680 Waco Street in Commerce City. Um, first, I'd like to thank city manager for separating out the oil and gas report that I had requested earlier. Um, I appreciate that. So I want to thank you for that. I'd also like to request that when you discuss the 1% sales tax going into Oakwood instead of the general fund, that you do so in an open meeting and not an executive session. At the last meeting, I stated that in my opinion, you sometimes keep things either secret or hard to find. And here's a great example of having a discussion in public where the residents can see what you're discussing and listen to what you're discussing. Second, I urge you to renegotiate the agreement to the advantage of the residents. Although frankly, I'm a little concerned that if you don't give them that 1% sales tax, they're just gonna renegotiate the Metro District Agreement and up our taxes 
anyway. Um, but still, I would rather that we re renegotiate it so that the residents get the advantage and not the developers. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Does anybody on council have any questions for the speaker? Councilmember Madera. Just wanted to thank Ms. Sanchez for her work that she does on our board of commissions and uh, winning that grant. That's pretty awesome. And you know, I just want to address uh, an issue that you know sounds like it's a recurring theme right now that we're doing things behind closed doors and. That's not the case. You know, we don't make decisions in executive sessions. This is um, more to direct negotiations so that we can have those negotiations and with the developers and not, you know, show our hand in that way. So it's not that we're doing things um, behind closed doors. It's that this is for negotiating purposes in order to get the best deal for Commerce City. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Sanchez? Seeing none, thank you again for your time this evening, ma'am, and thank you for your work on the Cultural Council and for uh, pursuing that grant on your own in order to land that. I think that's just phenomenal and appreciate your contributions to our community. Next up, we have Phil, and I'm gonna apologize for butchering this name, it looks like Herbachi. Phil, if you're in the meeting, you can hit star nine on your phone or use the raise hand function in Zoom. Mayor Huseman, I do not see Phil in the meeting. Thank you. We'll move on to Steve Douglas. Steve, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak on this. Uh, first of all, it, it was very alarming to see that an ordinance for road impact fees was, was recommended to be an update every three years. That's crazy. I know when I was a council, we hadn't changed our recreation fees in 25 years. So that's not waking also. And to know all these impacts and how much money is out there. So truly a 33% of 3%, you know, is 1%. Yes, it has increased 4.5%. And I will say again, last week, I know you guys talked about the six, the, the, the six A and the six B, and then knowing that all these drainage and, and um, road impact fees, how much are they really going to cost? That's a lot of money. But we have a developer here, here who's developing on both sides of ninety six. I'm sorry, between ninety six and and one hundred fourth. So they should be responsible for widening not only the back side of 96, but the front side of 104th. And 104th was designed with the NIGID and those were city improvements until you get up to reunion. So there's a lot of things that need, need to, uh, to uh, be updated with the impact fees. Um, you know, and then, there, then it wasn't brought up, but there's a golf course property credit in lieu of giving land to schools in open space, that has not been discussed. Uh, Oakwood, Oakwood has changed their views with uh, Capital Fee Foundation. Instead, they're going with their own foundation and it's not inverted for, sorry, for the same manner to say those are gonna be for future 27J schools. That's for 27J to decide where that money goes within reunion or within its, within, within its own confinement as far as financials. Buffalo Highlands borrowed money from the city to develop 96 all the way down to Buckley where the bridge is. And that bridge is designed for four lanes. How come Oakwood has not developed their side of the street to make it four lanes all the way down to that bridge? <clears throat> so there's a lot of things for you to consider. So please do not allow this extension to go on because they will be grandfathered in with those old impacts. Let it die, and when yes. you go forward, think about what's going on. And the previous, uh, the first uh, uh, speaker said, there's certain percentages that they're supposed to, to do. Here's the last thing I wanted to say. 
they're supposed to be ancillary, commercial, retail, and business with the proper planning and zoning principles and further that the zoning and property for such purposes for compatibility with their planning and they have not done that. So please, I urge you, understand about going to executive session, do this in the open. Yes. Because you only go into executive session to get, this is a legal matter. You won't get sued. Thank you. Mayor Huseman, I believe you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Does anybody on council have any questions? Seeing none, we thank you for your time this evening. If you wouldn't mind passing the phone off to your wife so that she can begin her three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize I was up. Hi, I'm Christy Douglas and I'm really um, thankful that we have this opportunity to speak tonight. I am also going to ask that you allow this to sunset and run its course. Uh, they've already had the opportunity to make use of this for 20 years, and there is no reason to extend it for another 10. These tax dollars should finally be going into our general uh, fund at this point, and they shouldn't be going to benefit the master developer, especially for another 10 years. I totally agree with Councilwoman Noble that it, it feels like that we are becoming a company town. I've talked to so many people from Green Valley Ranch and, and they, they have the same feeling and they're very frustrated with what's happened there. I don't want history to be repeated here in Commerce City. As far as having the discussion in an executive session, I would say that you have all of your discussion on this in the open before the public so that we know what's going on. Executive sessions have become abused. They are intended to be for legal advice and just for legal advice, not for you all to have discussions about what you want to do so that the public doesn't have an opportunity to hear what you're saying. So please, I'm not saying that you're trying to have it do anything behind closed doors. I'm just saying have those discussions in public because the public is affected by this. You know, I have seen Oakwood pull some stunts here. And to me, they, they can't be trusted. I mean, when they take away the mixed juice that was promised to us on 104th and they turn it into residential and, and they're, they're wanting to have rental properties built and, and, and filling us up with, with residential with no services, that's, that's not right. And they're privatizing the school district. When did they become our government, they're supposed to be a government within a government. And unfortunately, because we have metro districts here in Colorado, that's legal, but it doesn't make it right. So really consider this, look at it, please let this sunset and let's move on, but let's get the control back into the public's hands. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Douglas. Does anybody on council have any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, we thank you for your time. We'll move on to Guillermo Serna. Guillermo, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Can you hear me now? We can, yes, Guillermo. You'll have three okay. minutes once you begin. Guillermo Serna, one, four, one, two, two is the hundred and second place, Commerce City, Colorado. What I'm listening to tonight is the fact that there has been a lot of mistakes have, that have been made in the last 20 years since this contract with these companies and King Supers and all that type of stuff. And it may not be you, but maybe previous 
councilman that made that mistake. But the thing of it is, is that you were elected to straighten some of these things out. And your administration right now seems to be telling you what to do instead of the other way around, irregardless of what is said. We, the people, when we voted 20 years ago, 2000, we voted for a contract because they had the upper hand. They wouldn't build here unless they were given something. But these people now have made a heck of a lot of money on the backs of Old Town that haven't been met. I'm still waiting for Highway 2 to be looked at. I'm still waiting for 96 to be built all the way to Tower Road. I'm still waiting for the bridge over 76 and 104th so you don't have that dip there. And our school systems are going wild. You, the city, has got to understand that you can't keep doing business the way you're doing business or the way it was done before. Let this go. They already did what they said they were going to do, but they really didn't. And I'm saying, don't do this because everybody else is going to jump on board and it's going to be on the public's back to get this done. The people gave you the trust to make the right decision. And this isn't right, irregardless how, how anybody looks at it. They want control. And really, you say fees. Actually, it's tax without representation. And we don't have any control over it. So these are things that, that we have and you have to make. And please don't let this happen because too many mistakes have been made. And I think that you can straighten them out with due time, but you're gonna have to do the governing in a different perspective other than just a home rule city. Thank you, Mr. Serna. Does anybody on council have any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, we thank you again for your time this evening. I'm going to circle back. Looks like Renee Miller Chacon is in the meeting. Give her an opportunity for her three minutes. Renee, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes, Renee. Awesome. Claso Kamatia Mato, Claso Kamatia Tatonatio, Claso Kamatito Nantin Clali, Claso Kamatia Abuelitos, the Abuelitas, and all the ones that came before. You live on the land of the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Lakota, the Chicano. 48 tribes that still live and travel through here, and many disproportionately impacted communities. This is beyond just voting. How restorative are you honestly being with context to our community for protections? At this point, we already know that a lot of communities are being pushed out and gentrified by other urban renewal spaces by developers in Denver as it is. You need to live in context and have more protections to understand anti-gentrification ordinances to also deter new developers or old developers from predatory tactics. It has gotten to the point that they have been predators. It is taxation without representation. That's why it's beyond just voters. So how many community monitoring and modeling has really included to have their type of protections, perspectives and narratives so there's no longer disproportionate impacts or cumulative impacts. We do live in context now to know that there's been enough predatory development without infrastructure to support our communities in the proper ways that it should have for the last 20 years. And look at the particulate pollution, the transportation issues, and even the healthcare issues that we already have in these spaces. We need to be mindful to also regulate any new developers or any old developers from continuing the same type of predatory behaviors that only benefit for the short term, but don't really have long-term effects or are only benefiting for this economic benefit. We need health and safety to also be in these spaces. If you're honestly going to expand, 
community needs to be included with true equity from here on out because of these contexts of understanding disproportionately impacted communities. Honestly, we have sat on many different councils and many different spaces to understand that type of data. And so to bring in community in these spaces now could only benefit you to be more included into the community as well. And to reach out beyond just voters and just taxes, but to honestly see Commerce City as a new revolutionary space to be more renewable, sustainable, and inclusive in a way that we're not seeing reflected anywhere else. This should be able to translate in our education. This should be able to translate in other spaces. Privatization is a way to just eat with money and kill our life-giving spaces with money. So you need to live objectively in the spaces and platforms that we've elected you to honestly provide public health and safety, renewal and restoration to disproportionately impacted communities that have already lived here for 20 years, but have honestly had no other benefits and economic benefits is not enough anymore. We need honest community benefits and community inclusion in a way that no longer has an acceptable marginalized class of communities living around here. And just because they're not voters, not able to honestly live and thrive safely. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Does anybody on council have any question for the speaker? Seeing none, we thank you for your time. I'm going to circle back around and see if Ramon Alvarado is still in the meeting and able to uh, speak at this time. Ramon, you should be able to unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes once you begin. Good evening. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can, Ramon. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Council members. Appreciate your time. Uh, I'll just keep this really short, uh, but just a couple of questions that I try to educate myself as well as the community is. Uh, in regard to the 33% three, three, of the 3%, uh, I guess the first question I have is how that number was derived and how does that translate to dollars? I think looking at the dollars is very important as well. Um, also, how does this agreement compare with the other nine locations that Oakwood um, has locations that they're also building around, our, around Colorado? And then the other question I would have is to um, request would be to look at section 10.2, 10.3 of the agreement, where I believe it allows Oakwood in this case to uh, pay fees in lieu of donating land um, for schools, parks, and so forth and so on. The reason I ask that question is because um, this is a prime uh, market for, for home builders. Uh, in my observation is that they're in the business of building homes and not necessarily communities anymore. And that's a concern for me, for sure. One reason my family and I moved to Commerce City because we were sold on one of the plans uh, here in Reunion where we live at now, where it was gonna be a very mixed zone, not just homes, but we were able to enjoy parks, uh, also commercials uh, and things of that nature. I don't believe that is happening uh, at this time. Um, I do want to point out a quote from the former owner and co-founder of Oakland Homes before they got acquired by Clayton Homes. And I'll just read off this quote. One of the neat things about this combination with Clayton is that they can help improve our factories to the next level or two. And uh, at work, uh, with Clayton, we're now going to have a gold standard as a resource to build improvements into our processes, not just for us and our profits, but also for our home, home builders or home buyers, excuse me. You notice that there's nothing to be said about communities. Uh, with now that they're being bought or have been bought by Clayton, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, they're having greater pressure to render greater profits and they're gonna achieve that through just building homes. And I'll just close with this is that if you look at the S&P Home Builders ETF, which is an investment over the 10, past 10 years, that ETF has increased 368%. To me, what this means is that Oakland Homes has been able to improve its efficiencies, has been able to achieve economics of scale, which means that they're no longer need the 33% of the 3%. I think you are on the driver's seat here to make that decision that you could leverage this and make it better for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarado. Does anybody on council have any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, we thank you for your time this evening. 
Members of the public were also able to submit comments online and by mail. Written comments received were incorporated into the updated agenda packet. If anyone wishes to speak at future council meetings, please check the meeting agenda and city website for information on how to register or submit written comments. Now we're gonna have two votes on uh, topics scheduled for executive session. As a reminder, city council does not take action during executive session and will take formal public action, if any, on these topics at a later public meeting. At this time, I'm looking for a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 parentheses four sub parentheses E and F for the purpose of discussing personnel and negotiating matters related to the city attorney and the interim city attorney position and to adjourn following the conclusion of the executive session. Not seeing anybody making a motion. We did receive an email earlier today from the city attorney with uh, um, basically the negotiating position. If everybody is in agreement with said position, we could avoid said executive session. Council member Hurst. Yeah, I was going to make the motion uh, to enter executive session based off of that email that we did receive today so we can have that discussion. Okay, so I have a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing the interim city attorney, Council Member Madera. Second that motion. I have a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402, parentheses four, sub parentheses E and F for the purpose of discussing personnel and negotiation matters relating to the city attorney and the interim city attorney position and to adjourn following the conclusion of the executive session. Is there any discussion? Council Member Noble. Sorry. Uh, seeing no request for discussion. Um, I personally don't feel that we need to. I was fine with the email that came out. Um, and uh, it was within the confines of what we had discussed last week and what we were looking for uh, for that position. So um, I'm good with proceeding with that without having to go to this executive session. That being said, we will do a voice vote. All those in favor of Brandon and do an executive session for the purpose of discussing the interim city attorney position. Please raise your physical hands in the chat window so your vote can be counted. And we are at a tie four to four. So that motion fails. Next up, I'm looking for a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 parentheses four sub parentheses E for the purpose of providing direction on negotiating matters related to the extension of a sales and use tax agreement with reunion metropolitan district and to adjourn following the conclusion of the executive session. Councilmember Madeira. So moved. Councilmember Grimes. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second to enter into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 parentheses four sub parentheses E for the purpose of providing direction on negotiating matters related to the extension of a sales and use tax agreement with Reunion Metropolitan District and to adjourn following the conclusion of the executive session. Is there any discussion? Council Member Grimes. Thank you, Mayor. Just curious if there's a way that we can kind of bifurcate this process. There are probably portions of this that are specifically negotiating that I think should be handled in executive session, but I think there's probably other parts of this discussion that could be had publicly, maybe specific to each of our positions on whether or not to approve um, the approve or deny the extension. Um, currently, our agenda has us on taking the vote to go into executive session. Following uh, said vote, we could potentially have um, conversation outside the executive session. Mr. Sheasley, looking to you for clarification on how we're set up here. Thank you. Given that you have a pending executive session motion on the floor, you could either withdraw that, amend it to limit its purpose to those areas if you can identify them, Councilmember Grimes or um, have that discussion uh, yeah, or, or table the current motion to have that discussion that you wanted to right now if you want to have that, that discussion outside. Um, I don't know that there was any vote scheduled on 
the executive session and the special meeting. I'm just thinking about the agenda because it is a special meeting. I do believe that you could kind of give consensus if you wanted to do that outside of executive session on any of the matters subject to negotiation. So you just have to resolve the motion on the floor first. Mr. Sheasley, given the fact that we do not have one member present, are we capable of having consensus? It's my understanding in previous meetings when we have not had a full council, then we were not able to amend an agenda for a special meeting that was agendized. That's correct. Uh, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the negotiating positions. And so whether that's an executive session or not, I believe council could address that um based on the members present here without needing to get consensus for that may i just go ahead and council member grimes may i just amend my request then um i i would just like to amend the motion councilman madera to limit our discussion to, for negotiation purposes that is the current so, executive yeah, session true. motion yeah, I had a question, I guess, um, that might provide some clarification to this. So um, just talking procedure wise, you know, we, we talk negotiation during the executive session, then staff goes back to negotiate, correct? And any decisions that would be made would be in a public meeting, right, at a later date? Yes, correct. The open meetings law provides seven different bases for having an executive session with the approval of two thirds of the quorum, um, legal advice being only one of those. Um, and so determining negotiating positions, instructing negotiators, developing negotiating strategy is an item that is specifically allowed by state law. Um, but the end result of those negotiations would be presented to the public um, and discussed in a meeting publicly before actions taken. Councilmember Grimes, you want to follow up? I do. Thank you. I, I realize that the motion is specific to negotiating purposes. I was just wondering if we could specify the language to limit it expressly to negotiating, because it seems like there's a concern amongst the public that other other topics may come up or there may be further discussion. It was mostly to dispel the idea that there would be further discussion beyond a negotiating position. Well, the, the, to be honest, uh, you would not be permitted to go beyond that topic because that's the announced topic in the in the motion. And, and so it would just be for negotiation purposes. So unless you wanted to limit it to negotiating specific items um, in the contract, that would be the only useful motion if it changed to the motion, I believe. Okay, thank you. Council Member Noble. Um, as uh, Mr. Tinklenberg mentioned at the beginning, there's actually two things on the table. One of them is the uh, consolidated development agreement. The other is the uh, sales and use tax benefits. Um, and I also have questions that I wanted to ask of staff um, to follow up on some of the questions that were presented by the uh, speakers. Is, is this the opportunity to do that or must I only speak to this motion? I presume I can only speak to the motion, but I was hoping to have an opportunity to follow up. I would um, oppose the, the motion. Currently, we can only speak to the motion. However, we can circle back and try to get some follow up. Okay. Seems there's the, seems a desire for additional conversation to take place. Yes. So um, I am opposed to negotiation because I don't wish to extend. I want to start over. So there is no place for a negotiation if you're letting this agreement sunset and beginning again. So that's my position. Mr. Tinklenberg. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that comment, uh, Council Member Noble. Uh, the only thing is, uh, we sort of are starting over. I mean, there's elements that that uh, seem to be acceptable, but we we still need guidance from council in terms of what you want in that agreement. So uh, that would be the question, you know, in terms of we need your guidance in terms of what you want in the agreement. 
I am gravely concerned that um, there will be issues that are not uncovered if the agreement stands as it, as it is. It needs to expire as it is supposed to do on December 31st, 2021, and we start with a fresh document. I don't want to amend this document. I want to start with a fresh document. For example, I mentioned arterial streets. That was 2.2 in the consolidated agreement. Owners shall improve or shall pay to improve one half of the proposed width of arterial streets abutting the property. That was in the agreement and that hasn't been accomplished. So I want to start over with a new agreement. This agreement is to expire. So I would be voting no to negotiate. Accident. Any other discussion regarding the motion to go into executive session? Council Member Madera? Yeah, I mean, if we don't talk negotiation points, then you really give staff no direction, right? And whether it's a new document from scratch, that can be negotiated. I mean, at this point, we're just talking semantics, right? But we need to give staff direction on what we want to see. If we want milestones, we have to discuss that. Um, we got to hash out the details and, you know, by not going into executive session, it's really just a cop out and not doing our jobs, right? This is why we were elected to make the difficult decisions and hash out all these um, agreements. And so, you know, whether we let the, let it expire or not, we need to give staff direction and we need to give them the negotiations negotiating points that they need in order to go back and make progress on this rather than just just leave it die and do nothing you know it's, it's our job to to figure this out council member noble i have an amendment to make to the motion okay that uh we enter into negotiations and allow the consolidated agreement, consolidated development agreement of 2003 to expire to begin again. I have a motion to amend the current motion to enter into Mr. Sheasley, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I, Council Member Novo, forgive me. I think what you're trying to do is say, we can go into executive session if it's only for the purpose of negotiating. I'm sorry, I, I didn't try. Only for the purpose of negotiating something, but not for negotiating an extension uh, of the existing agreements. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that for me, Mr. Sheasley. Do we have a second for that? Council Member. Well, that would be an amendment to the motion on the table so right which is why i'm looking for a second for that amendment council member Allen thomas i'll second the motion i have a motion and a second to amend that is there any discussion on the amendment council member grimes um i thought procedurally the an amendment to a motion had to be approved by the original motion maker only it's only if it's voluntary so yeah. You're, yes. If you turn it down, Council Member Grimes, then then it would be a vote. So either way, are you accepting my motion? No. There you go. All right. I have a motion and a second to amend the original motion for going into executive session to state that it will not be for the purpose of doing negotiations on the current agreement extension, rather only negotiations on a new agreement. Is there any discussion, Council Member Madera? Yeah, I guess is there, there's like some confusion as to how extensions work on contracts. Because you know, usually the contract will run its course and the extension starts at the end. So, you know, the the contract kind of expires as is, and the extension 
is basically a new contract with whatever we, we negotiate and both parties agree to. So I guess uh, I'm just confused as what the, the difference is in, uh, in this motion. Thanks, Mayor Noble. I provided my reasoning. Thank you. Okay, motion and a second to amend the original motion to go into executive session. We'll do a voice vote. All those in favor, signify by using your hand in the chat window. That's going to fail two to six. Okay, any other discussion on the original motion to go into executive session for the purpose of negotiations? Directing our staff to negotiate. Let me rephrase that. Seeing none, I have some comments that I have prepared that uh, would like to uh, express in consideration for this motion to go into executive session. This is not a discussion that needs to take place in executive session. Uh, we're not negotiating an economic incentive package. We're not competing with another city. We're not identifying any potential asks that should be made in private. During our conversations over this subject that occurred approximately 10 months ago, a conversation that did not occur in an executive session actually took place during a study session on December 14th. We expressed a desire to see a list of projects and a timeline for when these projects would be accomplished. This has not been provided. Now I know Mr. Tinklenberg mentioned some projects this evening, but we still do not have a list of when these projects would take place or what kind of timeline that we could expect to see from an extension of this uh, agreement. Um, I cannot in good conscience vote to extend this agreement with an organization that does not appear to be operating in the best interests of our residents. Some examples of this. It's a requirement that the district should submit a report annually to the city within 120 days of the close of the year. When I requested these reports last week, it was discovered that the city has not been furnished these reports for 2019 or 2020. The remainder of my comments will be based on the most recent report that I can go off of, and that's for the year 2018. I do not have current data from 2019 or 2020 to be able to base the rest of my decisions off of. I don't feel we can continue an agreement with an organization that is failing to adhere to such requirements. This agreement is between the city and the reunion metro district. Because of the framework of that organization, the agreement excludes the voices of residents that will be the most impacted by this decision. The agreement would be with the reunion metro district. There are no homes within the reunion metro district. It's a shell. Because of this, there's no way for the reunion metro district to generate revenue. Because of the service plans and the MILEPA, which is the Mill Levy Equalization Policy Act, each North Range metro district has to send their taxes to the reunion metro district. These NRMDs have homeowners elected to their board of directors, but are powerless to make a change, make improvements, or control their financial future. These board members are powerless when it comes to financial decisions such as this agreement or what projects would be funded because of this agreement. This district is run amok with the finances. When it was conceived, the intention was to have a mill levy cap of 50 mills. 35 mills for debt service was projected to be enough, and 10 mills was projected to cover the cost of operations and maintenance. The operations and maintenance was actually supposed to be prorated until full build out, and the debt mill levy should have actually been lowered to 30 mills this year. Instead, the current mill levy is set at 88 mills, with 50 pledged to the debt. Why is the O&M so high? Why is the O&M so much higher than what was projected? Why would I want to enter into an agreement with an organization operating in this manner? This metro district has bonds that were issued circa 2017 with a par value of $21.6 million. The district is not currently paying the principal on these bonds, a decision that the homeowners had no say on and a decision that would surely surprise residents impacted by said decision. But the district is repaying developer advances at an interest rate of 6.5% set in 2017. For context, in 2017, when I pushed the refinancing of the debt in my metro district, we lowered the interest rate from over 6% to just over 3%. An interest rate being set at twice what was available at the time is unconscionable. Given the organizational structure of the RMD, the lack of transparency by not furnishing the required annual reports to the city, the current state of cost being passed on to residents without the ability for these residents to have a voice, and the lack of a vision that would benefit the residents, as well as the fact that we don't have similar agreements with the other developers operating in this area, I cannot support an extension of this agreement and therefore do not have a need to enter into executive session and discuss negotiations. Therefore, I'll be voting no on this motion. Do want to point out that would entertain an extension in the future if all of the required reports are submitted. The Metro District agrees to adopt the mill levies that were projected when the district was formed as specified in the financial plans attached to the adopted service plans. And if and only if homeowners in the North Range Metro Districts are provided an opportunity to serve on the Re Reunion Metro District Board of Directors. 
being said, Mr. Gibson, can you please do a roll call vote on the motion to go into executive session for these negotiations? Council Member Madera. Yes. Council Member Alan Thomas. No. Council Member Noble. No. Council Member Wardiola. Yes. Council Member Hurst. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Grimes. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Frank. No. Mayor Huseman. No. Motion fails four to four. Hey, we will not be going into executive session for the purpose of the uh, Reunion Metro District uh, Consolidated Development Agreement. Is there any further discussion that anybody would like to make concerning the subject prior to us adjourning to the executive session for the purpose of discussing the city attorney and interim city attorney position? Council Member Hurst. Yeah, I still think we have to give some type of direction um, would be my understanding. Um, uh, Mayor Huseman, I think you, you came up with some very valid points as to why at the very least there has to be significant change to any agreement moving forward. Uh, many that, you know, I support right next to you on those. And, and I really think, like I said earlier, there's opportunity here and it's, it's a development plan. Um, again, we heard from, from our community tonight, as well as um, over the course of the last couple of weeks that we do need to have a bigger say. And this is one of the things that I point to as an opportunity um, for us to have a bigger say. And I also don't um, necessarily think that any developer, not just Oakwood or any master plan developer is going to um, shy away from this. I really think having a, a unified vision and, and being able to um, sat more in stone because we have more defined up here now in the north side of Commerce City, I think that's a good opportunity for, for everybody to come to the table and speak about that vision uh, and find a path forward on how to not only fund that, uh, but deliver on those uh, expectations. And so I really think this could, um, uh, if, if done appropriately with a, a collaborative approach, could actually set, uh, turn a page and set a good course for us. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm in agreement with letting it sunset and developing a new plan uh, moving forward. So that's the direction I, I want to vote for. Um, that's honestly what I was going to say in study session. Uh, no problem saying that in public as well. Council Member Noble. That was my motion. You voted against my motion. Um, um, I, I wanted to ask questions about the people who um, had sp spoken earlier. Uh, Dr. Sanchez asked about uh, mills and um, is the Reunion Metro District at the maximum of its mills? That would be in the service plan, I believe. I had a brief discussion, Council Member Noble, today um, about whether there are mill levy caps in the service plan. I will say that it is a very broad service plan and has assumptions about mill levies and uh, in the financial plan and certain scenarios where a maximum mill levy is required, um, all subject to adjustment based on assessment rates. Um, that said, I can't conclusively say this evening that they are at a maximum for their mill levies based on my understanding of the agreements. Okay, thank you. Um, I did want to also reiterate um, Mr. Alvarado's comments, and I believe that um, uh, Mr. Douglas raised it as well, that Section 10 talks about in lieu of land, so that, that was always going to be problematic. They gave Buffalo Run Golf Course in lieu of land for parks and uh, schools. Um, Mr. Fowler uh, talked about the percentages of residential, commercial, and so forth. And when we were having the discussion last week uh, regarding the rescission of the vote that would have brought subdivisions before the city council for the next six months, uh, which is a responsibility that we have as well to actually uh, make land use decisions. Uh, we do get hearings before us on a 
fairly regular basis. But Mr. Fowler mentioned um, commercial. And then during the course of that discussion, a council member mo uh, mentioned uh, commercial as well and suggested that uh, uh, it was hypocritical to then ask questions about uh, oil and gas. And I grew concerned afterwards that here is a company that is involved with uh, mineral rights and um, sites on all of their properties and that the um, avenues for commercial are being closed off. It almost boxes us in. And uh, that was a growing concern that I hadn't even thought about until it was raised by my colleague. And I thought, whoa, that is really a good point. I hadn't thought about that. If we have a shortfall, which we do because we talked about the per house basis versus our property taxes, that um, if all of the land is being switched over or much of the land is being switched over to housing, then we're of course in a bad position. So I do think that uh, certainly a milestone for a future agreement needs to include commercial. That's what that land is going to be set aside for and that's what it needs to be used for. Councilmember Madera. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're gonna have to go to the negotiating table at some point, right? You know, we're, we're talking about all these ideas and, you know, we're doing a disservice to ourselves because, you know, we, we need to hash that out and uh, have a position to negotiate because that's not, right now what we're doing is we're burning all our bridges, all our connections and networks and, you know, we're just saying it's not right. So we're just not even gonna go to the table and negotiate this. And so these are the things that, that we need to bring up and need to um, let staff know that, that we're gonna that we're gonna need in order to go through with an agreement. But it's not fair that you know we don't have the discussion, we don't come to any sort of consensus. And then you have a couple people on this council that are trying to give direction for the council in its entirety. So, you know, there's a lot of projects on here that are badly needed and they're regional projects. You know, it doesn't just uh, impact, you know, one neighborhood or one community. And, you know, by not going back and trying to negotiate and get an agreement on how this is going to be funded, how this is going to be achieved. Basically, we're just throwing that cost back on our citizens and saying, well, now the city is going to do it, but it might take us a while because we're waiting on, you know, to see if 6A and 6B passes. And then, you know, we're not even going to start talking about what what's needed or how we're gonna do it until this other agreement expires. Instead of trying to get ahead of the game and say, okay, this is what we need. These are gonna be our milestones. We're just gonna say, we're not gonna negotiate. We're just gonna sit here because, you know, everything's terrible and the best way to deal with it is doing nothing. That just doesn't seem right to me. So, you know, I hope that we pick this back up and actually have a conversation about it instead of, you know, doing these shows for the camera because, you know, this isn't doing anything productive if we're not talking about it and giving staff direction to, to go and negotiate and get the best deal for Commerce City. Before I call on Councilmember Noble, I'm gonna to respond to that comment. You seem to be misplaced on who's actually going to pay for these projects. These projects are not going to be paid for by a developer. These projects are going to be paid for by residents in this community because it's going to be their metro district taxes that are going to have to fund this. It's going to be their metro district taxes that they don't have a say on how much is collected, where it goes, or any of that. So, a comment that 
we're just taking it and putting it on the backs of our residents, it's already there. The problem is it's on a select group of residents who bought a house within the confines of this metro district. Let me rephrase that. They didn't mean buy a house within the confines of the metro district. They bought the house within the confines of a, of a North Range metro district who was controlled 100% by the reunion metro district with no voice. Absolutely zero voice. They don't get a say in who manages their district. They don't get a say in what the fees charged by their district will be. They don't get a say where the bonds will come from, how much will go towards paying the bonds, whether they refinance the bonds, whether they pay the bonds off early. They get nothing, no voice whatsoever. It is 100% controlled by the Reunion Metro District that has no houses in it, that has no homeowners sitting on a board of directors. Every decision is taken away from the homeowners. That is a far cry different from a majority of the metro districts that we're seeing right now in our community that have matured to the point where homeowners have taken control of them. And homeowners have gone about lowering costs, have gone about consolidating services to bring O&M costs lower, have gone about refinancing debt to get payments lower. When I first moved here, my mill levy was 67 mills for the Buckley Ranch Metro District. It's now down to 47 mills. And at the same time, we have also cut out the HOA payment every month as well. We were able to do that as homeowners to make sure that we had control. You're never going to have control under this current model. So we're not saying let's put the burden on taxpayers. The burden's already there. The burden is 100% there. And that is the policy with this entire plan because it's a negotiation with a reunion metro district, which means the metro district is going to have to match the funds. It's not coming from the developers. It's not coming from anybody but the people that have to pay the taxes in the metro district. And the people that have to pay the taxes in the metro district are the ones living in the North Range metro districts who, because of the Milepa, are having to pay an outlandish 88 mills. 88. This district was formed with the plan of only having 50 mills. It actually should have gone down to 45 mills this year. That's the way that it was organized and structured. So I, I, I cannot push back hard enough on the assertion that we're putting this on the back of taxpayers because it's already on the back of taxpayers. It's just on a very minute select organization of taxpayers who unfortunately have zero say in their financial future. So here, Mayor, doing as nothing, a resident of reunion, does, let me respond, please. Concurred. So does doing nothing solve that? What it does is we are not going to extend this agreement. By, by not extending this agreement, we are not putting those taxpayers in a position where decisions are going to be made to take their tax dollars and have to go out there and do that. We have the NIGID, the 6A and 6B out there. If taxpayers want to see these projects funded, they can vote in favor of that and allow the bonding. The problem with leaving it in the metro district model is nobody has a vote. That metro district does not have to follow under Tabor rules. They can raise mill, mill levies in order to accommodate what they want to accommodate. They have a cap. They were actually in 2000, whenever the district was formed, and the voters in the district, which basically the people who were propped up in order to form it, actually went out there and said $1 billion. That's how much we have the ability to provide debt. Now, the service plan limits how much debt can be there, but we can't even figure out exactly what that number is. We can't even figure out exactly what the mill levy cap is. Looking at all those documents and the agreements and the amendments and everything else that has come out there, it's there. So you know what? I'm letting it expire. That is my vote is to let it expire. My vote is not to have a negotiation on that. And if we need to fund projects, then we fund projects on the city level or on the GID district level, but we quit this idea that we're getting all this wonderful thing. Guess what? That $20 million difference between how much was rebated back to the Metro District and how much we've gotten in development, that's not paid for by a developer. That's, not, that's paid for by the residents. That's paid for by your neighbors. No, I'm sorry. I am not going to continue to allow that agreement to go forward in any shape or fashion unless we get some fundamental changes. If those fundamental changes are going to occur, then that metro district can come back and approach us and say, we hear you. We'd like to talk about that. But right now, 
I'm not going to be in a position to negotiate, and I'm not going to be in a position to extend this agreement and continue to hammer the poor residents who moved into those metro districts. Councilmember Noel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I definitely couldn't put it as well as you did. So thank you very, very much. Um, and I would like to say that, yes, I would like to leave this up to the voters. Thank you. Any other comments on this subject? Seeing that, uh, Mr. Gibson, can you remind me, we had a vote on going into executive session for the purpose of the city attorney. Can you remind me on the vote on that? Mayor Huseman, that vote failed four to four. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's talk about that for a moment. We did receive a meeting. Um, Mr. Sheasley, do we need to take action on that this evening or do we just take action on that whenever the vote comes back to us on November 1st or 15th? It would be presented on November 1st. Very good. Um, I will put it on the consent agenda unless anybody desires otherwise. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, seeing as we're not going to the executive session, um, we will not have to worry about that. So we will be able to adjourn. I'd like to thank everybody for your time this evening, as well as the community for watching and for participating in this evening's meeting. We'll see you November 1st. Um, prior to going, I will be in Salt Lake City tomorrow, coming back on Wednesday. So the mayor pro tem will be the mayor should the need arise. Have a good evening.